All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 people versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Um, with that, prosecution, call your next witness, please. Thanks, Judge. Good afternoon. We would call Detective Christina Perry. Detective, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, ma'am. You swear or affirm the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Mr. Young. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name and spell your last for the record? Detective Christina Perry, P-E-R-R-Y. And what is your occupation? I'm a detective with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office? I've been with the Sheriff's Office for nine years. And what are your current duties? Uh, I'm still a detective with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office under the Special Victims Unit. And what is a Special Victims Unit? Uh, typically, we do cases involving children, cases involving at-risk adults, and sex crimes. How about in uh, January of 2020, where were you assigned within the Sheriff's Office? I was with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office as a detective in the Financial Crimes Unit. Were you asked to assist in the investigation uh, in the disappearance of Gannon Stout? Yes, sir. And what was your role back then? I'm sorry, as far as... <laughs> you had a lot of roles, right? Yeah. Is that was... why it was tough to answer? Yes. Um, let's talk about the investigation kind of as a whole. Um, was there a group of detectives working together, sharing information, following leads in the search in the hopes of finding Gannon Stout. Yes, sir. Due to the size of this investigation, it was kind of an all hands on deck. We were all involved in uh, assisting with this investigation. Back on January 28th of 2020, uh, were you assigned to look into some social media pages regarding the disappearance of Gannon Stout? Yes, sir. Tell the jury about that. What was that all about? So I was trying to kind of gather more information because we were at an early point in the investigation, kind of just trying to figure out any little lead that we could go off of. Um, and I found a variety of different search groups that were titled things like Gannon Stotch Search Party, um, Where's Gannon Stotch? And so it was kind of a variety of different groups. So I started um, using a undercover Facebook profile that is used solely for investigative purposes. Um, to get into those groups to see if there's anybody that was posting messages about what was going on or if there was any intel that we could gather by following those groups. So would you routinely look at those different pages to see if there's any investigatory leads? Yes, sir. Things? Okay. Uh, back on January 28th of 2020, were you along with Detective Bethel in the process of interviewing uh, Al Stalk and the defendant Letitia Stalk? I believe so, yes. And were you present during the first interview at the police department with Al Stout? I was present. However, I was, I believe that was the time that I was working on the Facebook groups. So I was not necessarily watching the entire interview. Were you present when Mr. Stout called in and said, hey, I got some additional information to give you? Yes, sir. And what was that additional information? Do you recall? I know the interaction was uh, Detective Bethel was on the phone with Mr. Stotch and he had had some additional information about uh, Ms. Stotch's Tiguan not being at the residence. Uh, did he indicate to you that he went to French elementary school and didn't see the car there and that was troublesome because Ms. Stouck had told him that's where the Tiguan was at? Yes. yes. Over Yes, sir. And what did that cause you to do as a result of getting that information? So myself and Sergeant Kurt Smith went to look at the surrounding schools to include French elementary to see if we were able to locate her Tiguan. Okay. And do you remember about what time a night that would have happened at? 
I believe it was about 730, a little bit after. If your report indicates that you went to Mesa Ridge High School at 737 p.m. on January 28, 2020, would that be accurate? Yes, sir. And is that the first area you went to go look for the Tiguan at? I believe so, yes. And did you and Sergeant Smith go to the Colorado Springs Airport to look for the Tiguan? We did not. I went with Detective Marissa Williams. Okay, so you and Detective Williams went to the airport. Yes, sir. Uh, what time did you go to look at, for the Tiguan at the airport? I do not recall. Would it have been after 7.37 p.m.? Yes, sir. And why did you go to the airport to look for the Tiguan? So we knew that she had obtained a rental car, which we were notified by Mr. Stotch. So we thought that most people get their rental cars from the airport. So we thought we would go and kind of trace the steps, see if we were able to locate the Tiguan at the airport. And where did you look at the airport within uh, the airport looking for this vehicle? So we had checked the short-term lots as well as the long-term lot, I believe. Did you go to the rental car return area as well? Yes, sir. Were you able to locate this black Tiguan that Ms. Stock was driving? No, sir. Uh, did you later learn as to when that Tiguan had left the airport? I did. I do not recall what time it was right now, though. Were you involved in the search of the Tiguan? I was not. Okay. We'll, we'll cover that with someone else then. Um, were you asked to go to the residence to pick up some additional witnesses, uh, i.e. Gannon Stouk's sister, Lena Stouk? Yes, sir. What was that all about? Tell the jury about that. So we wanted to conduct a forensic interview with Lena Stotch. And so the, I was requested to come in uh, with Detective Williams S or transport Lena to the office of the sheriff for that interview. And did you do that? We got there and Detective Williams ended up driving her herself while I stayed to assist with the search of the residence. Did you also come into contact with an individual by the name of Harley Hunt? Yes, sir. And do you know who Harley Hunt is? Yes, my understanding is that Harley Hunt was Ms. Stotch's daughter. And did you or anyone else attempt to interview Harley Hunt on January 28th, 2020, when you went back to the residence? Yes, sir. When I was there, Detective Arndt had advised me that she had tried to speak with Harley, and Harley had refused to respond to the office for an interview and refused to give any information. And while you're there at the residence, do you remember about what time you got back there? I would have to reference my report. If your report says 10 p.m., would that be accurate? Yes, sir. So 10 p.m. on January 28, 2020, you're at 6627 Mandon? Yes, sir. And who else was there? Do you recall to do conduct the search? Uh, I know there was Detective Farrell, Detective Arndt, and Detective V. Hill were also present. And what was your role in that part of the search? So I performed scribe duties. Um, and scribe duties is I record all evidence that's collected and assist with putting it into packaging to be transported to our evidence facility. And so could you explain that process to the jury? Do other detectives collect the evidence, give it to you, you bag and tag it, so to speak? Yes, sir. So when you perform scribe duties, it's like a carbon copy piece of paper and every item that another detective finds during the search, they would bring me. Um, I would package it in an envelope and collect it all in one place, and then I was responsible for transporting it to the evidence facility um, when it would later be processed into evidence and completely sealed and everything. And approximately how long were you there, do you call? Uh, no, several hours. And did you have further contact with Harley Hunt at that time? Um, while I was waiting for other detectives, I spoke with her um, kind of about various topics. She had notified me about her career aspirations and about kind of different various things, but if I would mention anything involving her brother, she would refuse to talk to me. Was that unusual to you? It seemed odd, yes. Was she otherwise pretty talkative when she didn't talk about the reason why you're at the house searching? Yes, sir. And did you note the things that you actually uh, bagged and later submitted into the evidence locker? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a, uh, can you tell the jury those items and I can help you refresh? Yeah, I have a copy of my report if I can reference. If you could turn to, um, it would be page bait stamp 10075, five of six of your report. Okay. 
Have you done that? Yes, sir. Here are the items that you um, bagged and later submitted into evidence. Okay. I've had, we collected a burned carpet square found in the trash can located in the backyard of the house. And this was found by Detective Farrell. A candle that appeared to have carpet fibers, a sock, and other items melted into the wax. This was found in a different trash can located in the back of the house by Detective Farrell. On the objectives that you're saying, that where the stuff was found and who found it would have been related to it by somebody else? Mr. Young? Yeah, and it goes to the chain of custody. Detective Farrell is going to be testifying next, and he's going to cover these items. But since she's the one that actually put them in envelopes and sealed them, I've got to be able to cover it with her. Overruled. I think you're on number three there. Yes, number three was swabs from a black and white Nike woman's right shoe. This was found in the laundry room by the garage by Detective Farrell. Swabs from a black and white woman's left shoe. This was found in the laundry room by the garage by Detective Farrell. Swabs of the light switch located in the basement hallway outside of Gannon's room collected by Detective Farrell. Swabs of the light switch located inside Gannon's room in the basement of the home collected by Detective Farrell. Swabs of Gannon's bed located on the east wall of the room in the basement of the home collected by Detective Pete V. Hill. Additional swabs of Gannon's bed located on the east wall of the room in the basement of the home collected by Detective V. Hill. Swabs of the exterior side of Gannon's door in the basement of the home collected by Detective V. Hill. So you noted who collected those items. Would those detectives physically hand those items over to you for you to seal them in an envelope? Correct. I would place them into an envelope and we would close it, but not completely seal it until it was later processed at the evidence facility. And did you later process those items at the evidence facility? Yes, sir. And did you seal them with tape? Correct. And is that so when the items would go to the lab for testing, they would be sealed until someone from the lab opened them? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me turn your attention now to January 29th of 2020. Were you at the uh, El Paso County Sheriff's Police Department here, right downtown? Sheriff's office, yes, sir. And is that on Bermajo and Tejon, just across the street? Yes, sir. Um, were you there um, waiting for Ms. Stout, the defendant, to show up for an interview? Yes, sir. And did she show up? No, sir. Did she show up late? I believe she showed up later after I had already left. Okay. Uh, when she arrived, did you go out to look at the vehicle that she arrived in? Yes, sir, I did. And what kind of vehicle did she arrive in? In her VW Tiguan. And is this the same VW Tiguan that you were looking for the night before? Yes, sir. You had a description of it, I take it? Yes, sir. Did you have photos of it? Yes. Uh, so you, did you recognize it? Where did you see it on the 29th when Ms. Stout came down to the Sheriff's Department? Uh, she was parked inside the El Paso County Sheriff's mm -hmm. Office uh, parking facility that is located off of Custia. And it was parked, I believe, on the third floor when we located it. And how, what was its condition when you saw it? Um, it appeared to be freshly washed. There was still water droplets all over the outside of it. How do you know it was freshly washed? It was a otherwise dry day. It wasn't raining. And so the presence of water on the entire exterior was unusual. And was Detective Farrell with you at that point? I believe so, yes. And did he take pictures of the, of the vehicle? I believe so. <clears throat> and did you later uh, assist in obtaining a search warrant to search that vehicle? Yes, sir. Based on um, what Ms. Stout had to say in her interview, did you help obtain another warrant to search the house at 6627 Mandon Drive? Yes, sir. And 
as far as you know, did that house go back and be searched on January 29th, 2020? Yes, sir. Were you involved in that at all? I believe that one was just the Metro Crime Lab. Okay. Did you also have an opportunity to do what's called a canvas um, of various dumpsters in the university shopping center? Yes, sir. Why did you go to the university shopping center to do that? So we had received information that Miss Stock was seen at the Petco located at University Village um, on two occasions that day. This would have been uh, what day, do you the, recall? I believe the 28th, but I- If your report indicates it was sorry, January- 27th. <laughs> there we go, sorry. So January 27th, 2020, you had information that Miss Stock was at this shopping center? Yes, sir. And so what is a canvas of dumpsters? What does that mean? So kind of looking for something out of place, um, perhaps something that would have been at the home that was removed from the home prior to our search, such as a suitcase or bedding or something along those lines. Okay. Were you able to find anything and looking in those dumpsters and things? No, sir. And do you know how many times Ms. Stock went to that particular shopping area that day? I believe it was two times. And we're going to look at some surveillance video from some neighbor's house later on this afternoon. Does that coincide with some of the times that we see Ms. Stauck leaving um, yes, her residence? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to take you to January 31st of 2020 now. Did you receive some information that Ms. Stauck may have had rented another vehicle? Yes, sir. Uh, what was that information and can you share that with the jury? Uh, I'd have to re reference my report to remember the model of that vehicle. Sure, uh, we can go to page, it's bait stamp 01200. It would pay, be page three of three of your report dated January 31st, 2020. I apologize. I do not have that report with me. May I approach your witness, Sean? You may. <clears throat> I'm afraid you can read that top paragraph to yourself. Thank you. Does that refresh your memory? Yes, sir. You know the make and model of the car that uh, Ms. Stout was understanding may have rented at that time? Yes, sir. I had been advised by Detective Farrell that she had rented a Nissan Altima. And did you later learn that it was actually her aunt who had rented that vehicle? I don't think I had been made aware of that. Did you do anything to obtain um, a GPS or a warrant to uh, put a GPS device on that particular vehicle? Yes, sir. And why did you do that? So due to kind of the ongoing issues we'd been having with knowing her Miss Stotch's location because it had kept she kept telling us she was on her way and then she wouldn't be and everything going on we were afraid there was a chance of her fleeing um, she had a lot of family out of state so we were concerned that she may try to return out of state and so we decided to get a tracking warrant to be aware of her location and did you in fact do that yes sir and do you know whether or not a tracking unit was placed on that vehicle it was uh, did you also have information with regards to some financial transactions that were taking place between Ms. Stauk and Harley Hunt and their various bank accounts? Yes, sir. We were made aware that a large amount of money had been transferred into Ms. Stotch's, ac Stotch's account, I believe, from Harley's account. And would that have been $2,600? Yes, sir. And was that concerning to the, the fact they may be leaving the area of due to that transaction? Yes, sir, that kind of corroborated our thought of she'd be moving this money so that she was able to flee the state. And did you know where uh, Ms. Stock was from? South Carolina. And now I wanna turn your attention to February 1st of 2020. Have you still been continuing watching these social media groups regarding Gannon Stauk and, and things like that? Yes, sir. And did you at one point look into 
a group that called uh, Support T Stalk or words to that effect? Yes, sir. And was that on Facebook? Yes, sir. Did you see anything unusual in those postings during this time period? If I recall, that was the account that there was a family member of Ms. Stotch uh, posting on that page. Okay. And during the course of the investigation, did you learn of a photograph that was taken of Gannon Stout while he was in bed during the early morning hours of January 27th, 2020? Yes, sir. And did that cause you to look for anything based on those photographs? Yes, sir. We had observed that the photograph with Gannon had a specific set of bedding in it that was not located during any of the previous search warrants at the residence. At this time, I'd request to publish Exhibit 20 that's already been admitted in evidence. Go ahead. Thanks, Judge. Okay, behind you and to my left is um, People's Exhibit 20. Is that the photograph you're talking about uh, that you learned was taken on the early morning hours of January 27th, 2020? Yes, sir. And what is it in this photograph? What items are you looking for at this point? So the red blanket with, with the snowflakes on it had not been located, as well as the sheet that is up uh, above him, not uh, the one that's on the bed, but it's blue and I believe it has airplanes on it. Okay. Or anchors, I'm sorry. Anchors? Yes. And what about the pillow? Was the pillow ever recovered or ever found? No, sir. And so what did you do? We can take that down now, thanks. But what did you do uh, to look for these items and where did you look? So we looked at a couple different locations. Um, the primary one being we went to El Paso County Transfer Station, um, known as the dump. Um, and we had the staff locate the area of trash that had been collected uh, around the time frame of the 27th and they had told us where those items were and we conducted a search of all of the trash and garbage attempting to locate that bedding. And would this be the landfill or as yes, you sir. said, the dump? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, and did you search in the areas where that neighborhood, that trash would go to? Yes, sir. They had located where that area had been dumped and we were able to identify mail from different addresses on Mandan and Intrepid and in that area. And did you find anything related to 6627 Mandan Drive? No, sir. I'm gonna to jump to February 4th now um, of 2020. Were you also assigned to review various uh, surveillance videos from residents? Yes, sir. And would these be like ring video or doorbell videos, those type of things? Yes, sir. Uh, and I'd like to start out with video footage from 6643 Mandan Drive. Are you familiar with that address? Yes, sir. And did you review all the video from that particular address? Yes, sir. And just so we're clear, are some of these videos different? Are some of them motion activated and some of them 24 seven? Yes, sir. There's different types of video surveillances. Some of them are set by the user that is able to only alert when there's motion within a certain distance and they're able to adjust it. So they may only turn on if somebody approaches the front door, whereas others record constantly. And the one we're gonna talk about 6643 Mandan, does that record constantly? <clears throat> yes, sir. Did you sit down and watch hours and hours of surveillance video just to see what happens during the course of the 26th, the 27th, into the 28th? Yes, sir. What were you looking for? Trying to see if there was anything that we could go off of as far as suspicious activity, if we could see the time frames where Gannon was seen last, if we could kind of piece together the story of what happened. Were you also looking for um, cooperative evidence of things that Ms. Stout had told 
Detective Bethel and other members of your organization. Yes, sir. Were you familiar with this story about her being raped and somebody construction guy coming to the house, a carpet guy named Eduardo, that kind of thing? Yes, sir. And were you watching this video nonstop to see if anybody would come or leave from that residence, especially when you had a truck that had carpet repair on it? Yes, sir. And was that based on what Ms. Stalk was telling you? Yes, sir. Or not telling you, but telling members of your team? Yes, sir. Did you ever see a construction worker go in and out of the residence at the time frame that Gannon Stalk went missing? No, sir. When you're reviewing these particular videos, um, were you familiar with the people who lived at 6627 Mandon Drive? Yes, sir. You knew what Al Stock looked like? Yes, sir. You know what Leticia Stock looked like? Yes, sir. Do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Could you please point her out and describe what she's wearing? Uh, Ms. Stock is wearing a light pink shirt. May the record reflect the identification of the defendant? The record will so reflect. Go ahead. Did you know what Lena Stout looked like? Yes, sir. And Lena was the eight-year-old girl that lived there? Yes, sir. And did you know what Gannon Stout looked like? Yes, sir. How about Harley Hunt? Yes, sir. And you actually met Harley on the night of the 28th, right? Yes, sir. And did you know what vehicles were associated? We'll start with Harley. What kind of vehicle was Harley driving? I remember hers was a silver sedan. I don't recall what model hers was. Uh, was it a white Volkswagen Jetta? Sorry, white, yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, and we already talked about Miss Stauk and the black Tiguan Volkswagen. Yes, sir. Was there another vehicle that was assigned or that Al Stauk drove? Yes, sir. There was a red Nissan Frontier. Okay. And so as you're watching the videos, if you saw those vehicles move around, would you make note of it in your report? Yes, sir. If you saw those individuals walking around, would you make note of that in your report? Yes, sir. And obviously, if you saw a carpet worker named Eduardo go in the house and leave with a suitcase, would you put that in your report? Yes, sir. Did you see that? No, sir, I did not. When you were looking for um, the blankets and the pillow and, and the covers from Gannon's bed, did you have any information as to where to look? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. It's not the first time I heard that. <laughs> um, did you have any GPS information as to Ms. Stauk and her phone? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know what a Life 360 app is? Yes, sir. And was there a Life 360 app associated with the defendant, Ms. Stauk? Yes, sir. And were you able to track her whereabouts based on that app? Yes, sir. Do you know what a Life360 app does? Yes. Yes, sir. What does it do? So it's an app used a lot of time with families, so you're able to know where your family members are, and it tracks your location. And so were you able to search various areas that Ms. Stout may have been looking for items that might be related to this investigation? Yes, sir. Did you find anything? No, sir. Now... We talked about dumpsters and canvassing dumpsters and things like that. Is it critical that you get to the dumpsters before the dumpsters go to your words, the dump? Yes, sir. And by the time you get to this Life360 app, had several days gone by? Yes, sir. In front of you, there's a series of disks. Um, I'd like to start with People's Exhibit 41, which should be the one on top. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. And what is People's Exhibit 41? It is a disc containing video footage from 6643 Mandan Drive. And would that be related to January 27th of 2020? Yes, sir. Uh, approximately 10, 13 a.m.? Yes, sir. And did you have an opportunity to review that disc? I did. Uh, how do you know that? Uh, my initials and date are on the top of the CD. And does this particular disc have two clips on it? Yes, sir. And is it the disc that uh, shows 6627 Mandan Drive from 6643 Mandan Drive? Yes, sir. And does it actually de depict a black Tiguan, uh, a red Nissan truck in that area? Yes, sir. And does it actually depict the video that you reviewed from that location? 
Yes, sir. Uh, we would move to admit People's Exhibit 41 at this time. Okay. Exhibit 41 will be admitted. Go ahead. Let's go to 42 now. Do you see People's Exhibit 42? Yes, sir. What is People's Exhibit 42? It is going to be a, another video clip that depicts six or from six six four three that depicts six six two seven. Um, that is later in the day than the first disc. We talked about the Petco situation where Miss Stapp went there a couple times in an afternoon. Yes, sir. Are these time frames when the vehicle leaves and when the vehicle come back consistent with what we know and when she was at the Petco? Yes, sir. And does People's Exhibit 42 actually depict the surveillance video that you saw from 6643 Mandan Drive at 6627 Mandan Drive? Yes, sir. Move to admit People's Exhibit 42. Okay. No objection. Exhibit 42 will be admitted as well. Now, in People's Exhibit 42, can you see uh, individuals get out of this red Nissan truck? Yes, sir. Um, and People's Exhibit 43, is that an enhanced version of People's Exhibit 42 so you can zoom in and see, for instance, individuals getting out of the truck at a closer view? Yes, sir. And does that actually depict People's Exhibit 42, or at least a portion of that, as to when these individuals get out of the truck? Yes, sir. And can you see it more clear because of the zoomed-in, focused version? Yes, sir. Uh, we would move to exhibit, or admit People's Exhibit 43. Defense. Okay. Exhibit 43 will be admitted. Go ahead. Next one is going to be People's Exhibit 46. What is People's Exhibit 46? It's going to be another clip from the same address uh, pointed at 6843 and shows Lena arriving home later in the day. And is that accurately depict the video that you saw from 6643 Mandan Drive that depicts 6627 Mandan Drive? Uh, when Lena gets home from school? Yes, sir. And does it depict Lena out in front of the residence for a certain amount of time um, after she gets home from school? Yes, sir. And does it actually depict that as to what you saw on 6643, uh, from 6643 Mandan Drive? Yes, sir. Uh, move to admit, admit People's Exhibit 46. Defense. Exhibit 46 will be admitted. <clears throat> and then People's Exhibit 47. Do you have that? What is People's Exhibit 47? So that's going to be later again in the day once Harley returns home to the house. And again, does that actually depict that portion of the video that you reviewed from 6643 Mandan Drive? Yes, sir. Uh, move to admit People's Exhibit 47. No objection. Exhibit 47 will be admitted. And then finally, we have People's Exhibit 220 there. Do you see that? Yes, sir. What is People's Exhibit 220? That is when the vehicle leaves the house later in the day. Uh, would that be the next day of January 28th, 2020? Yes, sir. And did you review the surveillance video on the 28th in the morning hours? Yes, sir. From 6643 Mandan Drive. Does that People's Exhibit 220 accurately depict what you saw? A vehicle leaving 6627, uh, another vehicle backing out and backing into the garage? Yes, sir. Uh, move to admit People's Exhibit 220. Defense? No objection. Exhibit 220 will be admitted. Okay. So we're gonna go back to People's Exhibit 41. Uh, we indicated that it's two clips. Um, can you just briefly summarize what we're about to see or would you prefer to do that after we see it? Uh, I prefer to do it after. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were gonna say that. That's why I threw that in there. So why don't we publish uh, People's Exhibit um, 41. And again, these are two clips. We'll start with the first clip on the disc, okay? So why don't we pause that real quick, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, Ms. Gratiano. So now that we see uh, the first slides of this, people's exhibit 41, can you just point out what we're looking at um, and where 6627 would be uh, located? There should be a pointer up there. Oh, a pointer that. <laughs> yes, sir. So right here is the red Nissan Frontier associated to this address. 
Um, so this house right here would be 6627. And can we see the black T on in this image? Yes, sir. The black T on. And so would 6643 be a couple houses north of 6627? Yes, sir. So we're now looking from north to the south towards 6627. Is that right? Yes, sir. Go ahead and uh, hit play, please. Pause, please. We see an individual walking there to the red Nissan truck. Do you know who that individual is? It appeared to be Gannon. Are you sure about that? Yes, sir. Well, does Gannon drive the truck? No, sir. <laughs> All right, can we? Sorry, go. Is that you... hard for you to see from there? Yes, sir. Why don't we continue to play and watch and see what happens? Okay. Sorry. Does that kind of refresh your recollection of who that might be? Yes, sir. I believe that was Miss Stush moving the truck. The defendant, Miss Stalk? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, can we go ahead and resume, please? Thank you. We pause it, please. Now we see an individual uh, walk towards the back of the red Nissan. Do you know who that individual is? I apologize for before that was Gannon. So is this when we see Gannon come to the truck? Yes, sir. And do you recall the clothing that he had on? I do not. Is it a little bit more difficult to see on these TV monitors than a computer? Yes, sir. I imagine when you're watching these videos, you were probably looking at a computer screen. Yes, sir. Go ahead and hit resume, please. That's clip one for the record. It's approximately two minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, now clip two, does that overlap clip one a little bit? Will we pick up towards the end of clip one and then take it from there? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, can we play clip two now, please?
And for the record, that concludes clip two of People's Exhibit 41, which is three minutes and one second long. We talked about when you initially saw this video, you were sitting in a computer screen. Would you take notes as to what you actually saw happen and then later transfer those notes to a report? Yes, sir. And do you have that report there in front of you? I believe so. I'll direct you to page three of four of your report dated March 10th, 2020. Page stamp one, 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 three, seven. I'm sorry, you said March 10th? Yes. I do not have that one with me. Okay. Let me approach on it. You may. A copy of the report? Yes, sir. And do you have the descriptions of what you see taking place on the video as you're watching it uh, from your computer screen? Yes, sir. And can you just kind of read to yourself what you have noted from People's Exhibit 41 that we just saw uh, when Gannon and the defendant leave in the Rand Frontier truck? Yes. Okay, have you had a chance to do that? Yes, sir. And in your report, you specifically put who walks out to the truck when it's in the street, gets in it, drives out, and backs into the driveway. Yes, sir. And who was that? Uh, Ms. Dodd. Okay. And when you're watching this on your computer, are you able to go back and watch it several times and make sure you got everything right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, do you also know when... They come back out of the house and the truck is in the driveway. Who gets in and who's where? Yes, sir. And who do you know? What do you note there? I had observed that Gannon stepped into the driver's side back seat and Miss Stock appeared to get into the driver's seat after she walked back inside and then came back out. And do you have a time for that particular action? Yes, that was at 10 13 a.m. And do you have a time for when they actually leave? That was at 10 15 a.m. And does that coincide with this Petco trip that we talked about where she's seen at the Petco area and you search that shopping area? Yes, sir. Now, before we play People's Exhibit 42, um, what I'd like to do is have you summarize what we're about to see in People's Exhibit 42, okay? Okay. Can you do that? Yes, sir. So in that exhibit, the, I'm sorry, one of the other vehicles is leaving the house well, is People's Exhibit 42 when they come back after they leave at 2.20 p.m. in the afternoon on January 27th? Oh, I'm sorry, I brought the wrong disc. <laughs> this is confusing me. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. 42 is when they are seen returning back to the residence. Okay, so what do you see? What do you see on the video, and what did you note as you're watching it closely at your desk? So I observed that the Red Frontier returns, and it's hard to it was initially hard to tell um because she's seen stepping out of the vehicle and then um upon closer examination it was seen that a shadow is seen in the footage of what appears to be gannon stepping out of the vehicle as well and does that happen as soon as the driver's side door opens in the video yes sir this time we request to publish people's exhibit 42 you may
Can you pause it, please? Sorry. Okay, so we paused it at 2.35. Um, did you see the shadow you were talking about in this particular video clip? It is hard to see from this distance. Can you see it clearer in People's Exhibit uh, 43? Yes, sir. Now, I probably should have asked you this before we played this, but where does the shadow come from? I believe it is the back passenger seat. The door opens. If I could refresh my recollection. Well, it's on the opposite side of the truck that we're seeing here in the rear yeah. passenger side seat, right side of the truck. Yes, sir. And does it happen very quickly in the door? Yes, sir. We can go ahead and resume, please.
That concludes people's exhibit 42. It's seven minutes and 26 seconds long. I want to talk to you about the end there. Um, we see the black T1 right back out of the driveway, turn around and back into the driveway. Do you recall seeing that? Yes, sir. Did you tell whether or not it backed all the way into the garage? Based on the shadows underneath the frontier, it appeared to back all the way into the garage. And are you familiar with other surveillance video in this investigation? from across the street, 6626 Mandon Drive? No, sir. You didn't watch that one? I don't think so, no. And at the end of People's Exhibit uh, 42, we see some individuals, looks like they cross the street at the end of the road. Yes, sir. Start walking up the sidewalk. Yes, sir. Is that soon after the Tiguan is back into the garage? Yes, sir. And then we see a vehicle come by shortly after that? Yes, sir. Okay. And obviously, if there's other surveillance video across the street at 6626, they would pick up that same activity so you can coincide the two different videos. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. We're going to play People's Exhibit 43 now, and I just want to give it some context. It's not going to be, <laughs> excuse me, everything that we just saw in People's Exhibit 42. Tell us what we're going to see. Uh, so 43 is going to be the kind of zoomed in on those shadows that I referenced previously of being able to see a shadow consistent with somebody stepping out of the frontier. Okay.
That concludes People's Exhibit 43. It's two minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, could you see it clearer in People's Exhibit 43, the leg drop on the other side of the vehicle? Yes, sir. And do you know whether or not the garage door was open or closed when they got back? I do not. Would it be able to show it if it was from 6626 Mandon Drive across the street, if the garage was open or closed? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, did you annotate in your report what time Ms. Stout moves the Tiguan to back it into the garage? Yes. Yes, sir. What time is that? 2.24 p.m. And the next disc, People's Exhibit 46, is that approximately 3.11 p.m. when we see a school bus coming by that has Lena on it? Yes, sir. We'll go ahead and publish People's Exhibit 46 now, please. Go ahead and pause it, please. Okay, we paused it at two oh seven into the video. <clears throat> There appears to be a child by the red uh, Nissan truck walking up the driveway. Do you know who that is? It appeared to be Lena. And is that consistent with her coming from the bus stop, which is around the corner? Yes, sir. There appears to be people working on some kind of electrical box out in the front yard of 6627. Yes, sir. Did, do you know whether or not those individuals were ever interviewed? <clears throat> Detective Arndt was going to follow up with them. I'm not sure if they were interviewed. Okay. But what do we see with Lena coming home from school? Does she have anything in her on her person? Uh, it's hard to tell from here. I believe she had a backpack on her though. And is she able to go into the house when she comes home from school? I believe she went in very briefly. Um, can we work on the volume? Or not go up any higher? We're going to see if we can increase the volume, Judge, before you hit present. All right. Could you hear Lena talking and saying things to the individuals out in the front yard and to someone at the house? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Let's go ahead and resume it now, please.
Can you pause it, please? Who do we see that are walking on the sidewalk? Appears to be Lena. And did you see where she came from? It looked like she came from the area of the front door garage area of the house. Did she come from the opposite side of the truck? <laughs> I did not see that part. I apologize. Um, just to kind of give us some context. They get home at 2.20 p.m. What time was it when Ms. Stout moved the Tiguan into the garage? At 2.24. And the school bus comes back at 3.11, is that right? Yes, sir. And this video is 19 minutes and 29 seconds long? Yes, sir. Is Lena outside for this entire 19 minutes and 29 seconds? I'm unable to tell due to her being off camera. What time would it be if we take from the time the Volkswagen backed into the garage up until the end of this 19, I guess it would be what, 3.30, some, something like that? Approximately an hour. And from you reviewing all this video, who are the two people inside the house for that hour? Yeah, and, and his mother, or his stepmother, sorry, the defendant. We can resume, please.
And is that Lena that we'll see walking by? It's at 906, Sharon. We pause it at 1050. Your Honor, I think it might be a good idea for the jury to stretch out maybe or stand up or Okay. We can do that. Everybody do a seventh inning stretch. Well, good to go. Right. So before we hit resume and before the seventh inning stretch here, um, did you see where Lena went as she walked back towards the house? Yeah, she appeared to go on the other side of the Nissan. And would that be consistent with going through the garage door in other words, when we saw her get off the bus and come home from school, she walked on this side of the Nissan to the front door, perhaps. Yes, sir. Is it also consistent with going to the garage door if she's on the other side of the truck? Yes, sir. Okay, we can go ahead and resume, please. That's the key part.
Okay, that concludes People's Exhibit 46. Um, we see, is that Lane on the bicycle riding away from her house? Yes, sir. Do we ever see her when she gets back to the house? Are we able to pick that up at all? We do not. So we don't know what time she got back into the house? Correct. Okay. Now I'm gonna uh, publish People's Exhibit 47 in a minute, but before we do that, is People's Exhibit 47 essentially Harley getting home from work, Harley Hunt? Yes, sir. And is Harley Hunt in the house for a period of time? Yes. And then what happens after 10 or so minutes? Uh, Harley and Lena both appear to leave in Harley's vehicle. Yeah, if it's okay, what we may do is start it as to when Harley gets home and then fast forward to when they leave uh, because the rest of it's just the white Jetta sitting in front of the house unless the court wants to watch the whole. Is there, is there an objection by the defense? No. That's fine. Okay. We'll go ahead and publish People's Exhibit 47 now. So we paused it at 55 seconds. Um, we saw a white vehicle pull up. Do you know whose vehicle that is? It'd be Harley's uh, VW Jetta, or Jetta, sorry. And was that Harley who got out of the vehicle? Yes, sir. She goes in, and then you said her and Lena come out later? Yes, sir. Okay, if we can just fast forward to about, I would say 11 minutes. Okay, go back just a little bit, but right there's good. So before you hit play, we're at 1513 on the video, Your Honor. Go Can ahead and play. Okay, that concludes People's Exhibit 47 at 16 minutes and 16 seconds. <clears throat> if you have Harley getting home at 4.37 p.m. on January 28, 2020, she's in the house for approximately 15 minutes, would it be safe to say that at 4.52 p.m. is when her and Lena leave? Yes, sir. I believe I have 4.51 annotated in my report. I was close. <laughs> okay. Let's go to People's Exhibit 220 now. Now we're at on January, um, excuse me, that was January 27th, 
Okay, so January 27th at 4.37 p.m., Harley gets home. Yes, sir. And 4.51, they leave to go, okay? Now we're at the 28th, and I want to turn your attention to People's Exhibit 222. Um, based, um, 220, I'm sorry. Yeah, People's Exhibit 220, you're correct, Your Honor. We have two clips on this. Could you describe what the first clip is, if you remember? Uh, the first one would be the defendant leaving for the airport in her vehicle. And the second clip was when she had, had Harley move her Jetta and they kind of were just repositioning vehicles in the driveway. So would the first clip be at 8.13 a.m. or approximately that time frame? I believe so. And based on your understanding of the investigation, that's when she's going to the Colorado Springs Airport to pick up Al Stout, her husband at the time? Yes, sir. Okay. You can go ahead and play clip one, please. Now, we just finished clip one. It was, God, I want to say 50-something seconds. I didn't catch the time, Your Honor. Um, the Tiguan leaves the driveway and looks like it stopped at the end of the driveway. Did you see that? Yes, sir. Is that an issue with the tape, or did Ms. Stock actually stop and sit there for a second? I do not recall. You don't know? I'm not sure. All right. Let's go ahead and play clip two.
Okay, that includes uh, clip two, three minutes long. Uh, did it appear to you that the Volkswagen Jetta went into the garage? Yes, sir. Do you know what time that took place in relation to the defendant leaving for the airport at 8.13 a.m.? I do not. Okay, do you have that in your report? I do not, no. Can I retrieve that report, Your Honor? You may, go ahead. I can just have a second, Your Honor. All right. Do you have your report dated February 4th, 2020? I do. I'll turn your attention to the last page, which is five of five. It's bait stamp 01426. Do you document when the Jetta pulls out of the driveway and then pulls back into the uh, driveway and goes into the garage? Yes, sir. That was at 8.51 a.m. Okay. And when it pulls back in, is it 8.53 a.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. Those are my questions, John. Thank you. Cross-examination. <laughs> Good afternoon, detective. How are you? Good afternoon. Doing all right. All right. So you've been um, a detective with the sheriff's office for nine years now? A uh, detective for about three years. Been employed for nine years. Oh, okay. And going back kind of to your beginning with this, sorry, with this case, you did, how many searches did you do of 6627 Mandon Drive? I believe I participated in two of them. Okay. And one would have been on the Tuesday and then one on the Wednesday, were they in back-to-back -back days? I believe so. Okay. And what time did you get there on Tuesday? I would have to refresh my recollection by referencing my report. Yeah, that report up there? I believe so. Okay. I arrived at the residence approximately 10 o'clock on the 28th. So I believe it was about that time when I. Okay. 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock PM. PM. Okay. And when you got there, who's there? At that time, there was Detective Farrell, Detective V. Hill, Detective Arndt. I had arrived with Detective Williams, um, Lena and Harley were at the residence. They were at the residence? Yes, sir. Now, ideally, um, if you're doing a search of a crime scene, I, in the best case scenario, you're there quickly after the crime occurred. Yes, sir. And then that crime scene would be secured. Yes, sir. Why would you want to secure, why, why do you guys secure crime scenes generally? For preservation of evidence. Okay, because you don't want other people, civilians, whoever, <clears throat> going into that crime scene and either taking something out that should have been there or leaving something that shouldn't be there, correct? Yes, sir. And sometimes it can be even done unintentionally. I mean, some, you know, you can leave trace evidence, fingerprints, DNA, hairs um, that could corrupt a crime scene if it's not secured. Yes, sir. And so this obviously, based upon the information, um, the best case scenario, it's up to a day, if not more, past when the crime, when you believe the crime occurred, when the uh, houses search, correct? Yes, sir. And do you know how long? And so Harley was Harley there before any detectives got there? I do not know. I was not the first one there. And do you know how long Harley had had unfettered access to the crime scene? I do not. She was the only, well, she's 17 at the time, but she's the closest thing to an adult civilian there when you guys get there. Yes, sir. It's just her, her and Lena. Yes, sir. Okay. And then you leave Harley, you, Lena is taken from the crime scene, but Harley is left there, correct? Yes, sir. And so again, Harley is, has access to the crime scene um, after the search is done and then before you guys do the search the next day. 
while we were while I was at the residence, uh, I had described that I was performing scribe duties. So I was in the kitchen area, and Harley remained in my immediate view the entire time. I'm sorry, that was a bad question. But after you guys leave, and before you guys come back to do the second search, she would have had unfettered access to the crime scene. She left while we were at the residence. I do not know if she had returned to the okay. so address. She, she may or may not have unfettered access to the crime scene. Yes, sir. Okay. Going to those videos that <clears throat> we were just watching, um, it appears that the truck gets back to the residence around 219. That, I'm going back to one of the videos that we were just watching just now. Yes, sir. Okay. And that is, <clears throat> at least of what, the best of what you can see, it, it appears it's Mistalk and Gannon getting out of the truck at that point in time and going into the residence. Yes, sir. And then about sometime after three, we see the school bus and it looks like Lena then goes into the house um, around 311, 3, 310, 311. It's a little bit after that, but yes, sir. Okay. I also noticed <clears throat> on that video, it appears d during the whole course of the day, there was a lot of utility workers on that street, right in front of the house, working on that transporter, responder, correct? Yes, sir. And you never interviewed any of those utility workers? Detective Arndt was going to be reaching out to them. To the best of your knowledge, did any of those <clears throat> utility workers report hearing gunshots? Not that I'm aware of. Based from that video, if somebody's coming from the south, you can't really tell. I mean, somebody could come from the south and get into that house and be undetected, correct? Potentially, yes. Well, I mean, that's how, I mean, it appears Lena did that when she came back from her bike. Yes, sir. Because we see her leave on the bike <clears throat> and you watched like, you watched close to like 48 hours of that video, correct? Yes, sir. A lot of video. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so we see Lena leave on that bike. We never see her go back in the house yes, from sir. the bike trip. Yes, sir. And then we see her leave the house with Harley to get in the car, correct? Yes, sir. So it appears that somehow Lena was able to access and get inside the house that was not captured on that video, correct? Yes, sir. It, in some portion of that video, especially during the day, that actually appears or sounds like you get some pretty decent sound quality. Yes, sir. I mean, you can actually hear Lena talking with the utility worker there. Yes, sir. And that doesn't feel like they're yelling. It kind of appears like they're just talking. Yes, sir. You never heard any gunshots in the 48 hours of video that you reviewed. Not that I recall, sir. And then lastly, it, that the next morning, for some reason, it doesn't appear to be sound on the video. Do you know why? I do not. Do you know why sometimes there's sound on the video and sometimes there's not? I do not. Okay. No further questions. Redirect. Yes, sir. In an ideal situation, you'd like to show up to a crime scene right after the crime happens, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and one of the reasons you want to do that is because you don't want whoever committed a crime to clean up that crime scene, correct? Yes, sir. Now, who was controlling when police came to the house on January 27th, 2020? Mr. and Ms. Stott. The reason why the sheriff's office got involved at all is because Ms. Stout called 911, correct? Yes, sir. And she called 911 shortly after 6 p.m. that evening? Yes, sir. Uh, police arrived shortly after 10 p.m. that evening? I think initial responders had arrived earlier. The detectives did not arrive until later. But you can see when you're looking at the video on 6643, when the police, when the sheriff deputies showed up, right? It was after 10 p.m. that night? I believe so. Okay. And we, the jury's already seen the body-worn camera of Deputy Yumpkin and the audio of Deputy Parker. Um, uh, objection, another question? Yeah, sustained. I'm just... I'm, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I agree. Will, jury, that's good, because I'm going to tell the jury that, that they will disregard uh, counsel's comments. As we know, nothing that the attorneys say at any point in time is evidence. Mr. Young, if you have a question, 
So you were able to see when the deputies arrived on January 27, 2020. Yes, sir. For the first time. Yes, sir. And that was after 10 p.m. Yes, sir. Now, based on your investigations and your career as a deputy in the sheriff's office, um, have you been called out to gunshots fired, those type of scenes? Yes, sir. And have you done neighborhood canvases where there's been gunshots alleged to be fired? Yes, sir. And have you talked to neighbors who have both heard gunshots? Yes, sir. Have you talked to neighbors who did not hear gunshots? Yes, sir. Um, is there ways to muffle the gunshot? Yes, sir. Is it surprising to you that no one heard a gunshot when Gannon was killed? Objection, Rollins. Overruled. No, sir. Did you even know that Gannon had been shot until after March of 2020 when his body was discovered? I did not. Did you even know to ask anyone if they heard gunshots? I did not. Those are my questions, John. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Detective Perry? No. All right. Thank you, Detective. You may step down. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our afternoon recess. If I can have everyone back in the jury room at, say, uh, 3.05, we should be able to start on time at that point. Again, don't discuss the case among yourself. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Uh, with that, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you. you. May all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Uh, court will be in recess until 3.05.
frames. <coughs> I got him out. Yeah, I'll put him back. No, I've got all oh, the way in there. To work maintenance. Yeah. We got a batch. We just need oh, good. All right, for the jury, please. Yeah, because yeah. it's admins. Mm -hmm. You may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, Pupil versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Um, prosecution, call your next witness, please. Yeah, we would call Detective Tim Farrell to the stand. Detective Farrell, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear affirm the testimony about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name, introduce yourself to the jury, and spell your last for the record? <clears throat> Detective Timothy Farrell, that's F-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. I'm a detective with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, Ten years. And how long have you been a detective? Uh, three. Back in Mar or January of 2020, uh, what were your assigned roles to the Sheriff's Office? Uh, I was assigned to the Special Victims Unit within the Investigations Division. Were you asked to assist in the investigation in the disappearance of Gannon Stout? I was. And back on January 28th of 2020, was one of your duties uh, or assignments to go out and search 6627 Mandon Drive here in Colorado Springs, Colorado? Yes, it was. And why were you going out to search that residence? Uh, initially, the call came in as a, a missing juvenile endangered, um, which is why it got, it got referred to investigation. So we went out to try to figure out um, where the child had gone, whether we could find any evidence, um, whether they ran away, um, whatever the case might be. So we're just trying to figure out what exactly happened um, to see whether we were able to gather any uh, evidence. Did you have any idea what you were looking for when you went out there? Not at that point, no. About what time did you get out there on the 28th, do you recall? Um, the house, I believe it was around 10 p.m. Okay. Who was there when you got there, do you remember? Um, besides the other detectives, I believe um, Harley was the only other person on scene at that time. Did you know whether or not Lena, the eight-year-old child, had already been taken to go be interviewed? Uh, I'm not sure on that, no. Um, as you're out there on the 28th, you said around 10 p.m., were you getting information from the police department, the sheriff's office, as to the investigation, as to items you may want to look for, things like that? Yes, through the sergeant. Were people being interviewed at the sheriff's office and giving information and relaying it back to you as to what you should be looking for? Yes, they were. So 
So what did you know prior to going into the residence at 6627? Uh, I knew that patrol had been called in the day prior um, for a runaway. Um, they had not found any evidence as far as had not found a child on scene, um, hadn't been able to locate him. Um, and beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot of information when we got there. Um, once we arrived on scene, it, the information was pretty sporadic at that point. We, we didn't have a whole lot to go on. So what was the game plan? What did you do when you got there? Basically, we went in, took photographs um, of the entire scene. Uh, one of the other detectives took those. Um, and then we basically just went through looking for something or anything out of the ordinary or something that might help point us um, toward what where, where you might have went or what had happened. And did you and your fellow detectives search the entire house, every room in the house? Yes, we did. Um, did you find any loose shell casings that are looked like they had been expended from a gun? I did not know. Yeah, would that be something that would be unusual or suspicious if you found a shell casing on a floor somewhere? Yes, it would. Um, did you see any blood in the house? Not visually, no. Would that, again, be something that would be suspicious, draw your attention to that? Yes, it would. Um, you said you went through and you took photographs within the house. Um, did you take photographs of the exterior and the interior of the house? Uh, I believe so. It was another detective that took the photographs. <laughs> would you recognize those photographs if you saw them again? Yes, I would. In front of you to your right are a stack of photographs. If you could take a look at those, um, and for the record, those would be People's Exhibit 240, 241, 242 through 245, 247, 248, 250, 251, and we'll stop at 251 when you get there. Have you had a chance to look at those pictures? I have. And what are those pictures of? Uh, that's the inside of the residence. Um, appears to be mostly of the laundry room area. And are there pictures of some Nike shoes that are on a washing machine? Yes, there are. And do all those pictures, uh, I'll be specific for the record, um, People's Exhibit 240 through 245, 247, 248, 250, and 251, do they all depict the laundry room at 6627 Mandan Drive as it looked like on the night of January 28th, 2020? Yes, it does. And are we would move to admit those particular exhibits? Defense. No objection, Your Honor. Exhibits 240 through 245, 247, 248, 250, and 251 will be admitted. Go ahead. Request to publish 240. Go ahead. What do we see in people's exhibit 240 here on the TV screens? This is the entrance from the garage into the laundry room. And could you, uh, there's a, we got a stick pointer there. Stan, can you see that anywhere? Yes. Yeah. Can you just kind of point out uh, some things that I uh, asked you about? For instance, can you point out the entry to the garage in this photograph? Yeah, this door right here. And do you see a dryer or a washer there on the right? And is there appear to be a shoe rack there on the left? Yes, it does right now. And this is what it looked like when you got there on the 28th? Yes, it does. If we can go to 241, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 241? That is the washer and dryer in the laundry room. And do you know which one is the washer and which one's the dryer? I believe the one on the left is the washer. And Detective Fair, I'm going to have to ask you to speak up loudly because when you're facing the TV, your voice is going that way. And um, so let's go to People's Exhibit 242 at this time. What do we see in People's Exhibit 242? Um, large mound of clothing on top of the washer and the dryer. 
And is that what it looked like when you initially got to the residence? Yes, it does. And did you do anything to look through this clothing? Uh, myself, personally, no. Did anybody do that? Detective John Price did. And were you there when he was doing that? Um, I was not there when he was initially looking through it, um, but he called me up once he was looking through that. And why did he call you up, do you know? Uh, he found the a pair of shoes with um, uh, that, that seemed out of place to him with uh, a pink residue on the bottom of the soles. We go to 243, please. What do we see in people's exhibit 243? It's a little bit closer shot over top of the washer. 244? What do we see in 244? These are the shoes that Detective Price pointed out to me. And is that what they look like when you got into the laundry room? Yes. And you talked about some kind of, would you say, pink substance on the bottom of these shoes? Correct. Uh, what did you think that substance was? Um, there was suspicion that it was possibly blood and had been attempted to been washed, but had soaked into the sole issue. Why, why did you have a suspicion of that? Just based on our experience and, and the time that we've seen blood-soaked clothing, it just seemed out of place um, and seemed very strange to us at that point. So is this one of the instances that we were talking about when we started out that you didn't necessarily know what you were looking for, but if you saw something out in the ordinary, you're going to make note of it? Yes. And so what did you do upon seeing these shoes? Um, we photographed those, and then I also took uh, swabs of the bottom of both of the shoes. And in this particular shoe, uh, which shoe is which? Here's this is the left foot, and that would be the right foot. Could you point out on the right foot any areas of discoloration that you've been talking about? Right up through here. Um, this picture is a little hard to see, but in basically in on the indentations of the pattern of the sole, there was the pink residue. Okay. If we can go to People's Exhibit 245, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 245? This is where it had soaked into the foam on the shoe and gave that discoloration um, all throughout it. And just so the record's clear, you're using a pointer to point out uh, in the, looks like in the middle of the shoe where there's a crease. You're saying there's some discoloration there? Correct. Is that the area that you swab with regards to the right bottom of the shoe? Correct, right up in this area here. And if you would resume your seat, there's a, a brown envelope marked 246. I believe it's going to be on your right-hand side. Do you see that? Uh, 246. Okay, there we go. 246. Yes. You got that? Yes, sir. What is People's Exhibit 246? Uh, it states that it's one package of two swabs from women's black and white Nike shoes. And is that the swab that you took from this uh, shoe? Yes, it is. And how do you know that? Because uh, I placed it into this envelope, um, and it was later taken to evidence and then inputted into evidence by uh, D Detective Perry. And do you need to open that up to know that that's what's in that envelope? No. You know, at this time, I'd move to admit People's Exhibit 246. Defense? Exhibit 246 will be admitted. Go ahead. So we can now publish 247, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 247? This is, appears to be the other shoe um, and also has the pink residue and various indentations on the shoe. In 248? What do we see in 248? Um, this is the heel of the shoe, and again, there's more pink residue in all of the low areas and indentations of the shoe. And did you swab those areas with regards to this shoe as well? Correct. And now we're talking about the bottom of the left shoe? Yes. Um, and if there's another brown envelope, hopefully it's still there, 249. Correct. You see that? Yes, sir. What is People's Exhibit 249? Uh, it states it's one package of two swabs for women's black and white Nike shoes. And are those the swabs you took from the shoes we just looked at? Yes. And you need to open that envelope to see that those are the swabs? No. Move to admit People's Exhibit 249. Mr. Cook? Objection. Um, exhibit 249 will be admitted. Go ahead. We can go to 250 now, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 250? Uh, 
this was a pink towel that was in the washer um, next to the, or underneath where the shoes were at. And was that the only thing that was in the washer at the time? Yes, it was. We can go to 251, please. What do we see in 251? Again, this is the pink towel that was inside of the washer. Did you notice any red discoloration on that towel or anything suspicious with regards to that towel? Me personally, no, I did not. Are you just annotating that there's one towel in the washer and you're taking a picture of it? Correct. Now I'd like you to look at the next series of photographs um, of, that are in front of you. They haven't been admitted yet. It, it, they're they're going to be in front of you. It's 252 through 258, and then 260 and 261. Have you had a chance to look at those photographs? Yes, I have. And what are those photographs of? Those photographs are the, the beginning of those are in the family room in the basement, which is an area of the carpet that had been cut out. There's also burn, appeared to be burn marks on the couch. Um, the other photographs are of a, the trash cans, which are in the backyard of the residence. And what about 260 and 261? Are those close-ups of the trash cans? Yes, they are. And do all those photographs accurately depict the items you said they depict from January 28, 2020, from 6627 basement area and then the outside area where the trash cans are? Yes, they do. Move to admit people's exhibits uh, 252 through 258, 260, and 261. Mr. Cook? No objection to those being admitted. Exhibits 258 through, or I'm sorry, 252 through 258 and 260 and 261 will be admitted. Thank you, Judge. We're going to publish 252 now. What do we see in people's exhibit 252? This is the couch downstairs in the family room. Um, there was actually some carpet that was covering us up. And when we moved it, cause it wasn't actually tacked down or anything. This is what we found. And it appeared to be an area that had burnt through, um, a carpet had been cut out. And then this is the padding under the carpet that appeared to have been melted down to the concrete, which is what the white part is here. Um, the areas over here on the couch, um, appeared to have melted through the couch liner cover, um, and appeared to possibly be a waxy substance that was left on there. And prior to going to the residence on January 28th, 2020, did you have any information about a candle being fallen over and causing a fire? Um, initial information from the sergeant on scene, that information had been passed over or passed to him from um, the office um, that there had possibly been a fire in the basement caused by a candle. And is that why you're documenting taking photos of this area? Yes, it is. And did you bring that dog with you? No. Did you tell him the pose there or something or just happened? No, he was photogenic that day. <laughs> okay. People's Exhibit 253. What do we see in People's Exhibit 253? This is the couch um, and this is the waxy substance that we noticed on the couch. Um, these are holes within the, the fabric on the couch itself, as well as down through here with, with that wax substance as well. 254. What do we see in 254? So this is approximately a two foot by two foot square of the carpet that was cut out. This is the padding underneath that carpet that had appeared to be either burned or melted through. And this is the bare concrete on the floor. And this appears to be a section that was burned. And when you're there on the 28th, can you smell anything? No, I could not. Did it smell like this fire had been recent or you have noted that in your report? <laughs> I didn't smell anything at that point. And based on what you're seeing here, was it consistent with a candle falling over and burning right through the carpet, through the pad, and to the concrete? Uh, based on what I saw there, yes. Okay. And did you make efforts to find, for instance, this piece of carpet that had been burned? Yes, we did. So we can go to People's Exhibit 255 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 255? These are trash cans that were in the backyard on the side of the house. And so 
just for the jury's benefit, would it have been on the which side direction wise, north, south, east, west? <clears throat> Trying to remember, I believe it would be east, but it's it's been a while since I've been out there. Okay. We can go to People's Exhibit 256. What are we seeing? People's Exhibit 256. This is a trash bag that was on top of one of the trash cans. Um, and on the top of it, when we first opened it, this appears to be uh, melted uh, part of the carpet and the padding that was also taken out from underneath. And so would this be in the backyard of that residence? Yes. Um, is it fenced in completely? Yes, it is with a six foot privacy fence. And was there a gate with a padlock on it just on the other side of this? Yes, there was. Okay. So we can go to People's Exhibit 257. What do we see in 257? This is a approximately two foot by two foot square of carpet that was pulled from that trash can. Um, and on that carpet, this was a burned area with what I believe to be possibly a wax substance. Um, this is actually a hole burnt through the carpet itself. And 258. What do we see in People's Exhibit 258? Um, same piece of carpet, um, just a little bit closer up shot. Um, this is the hole that was burned through the carpet. And then there's more red. Um, substance that appeared to be part of the wax or whatever substance had had melted onto the carpet. You know, may I approach a witness. You may. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as two fifty nine. Sit here for a Ask if you can recognize two fifty nine. Yes, I do. What is people's exhibit two fifty nine? This is the. A piece of carpet that's pictured in that photograph. And does it actually, uh, does it look like as it did when you packaged it back on January 28, 2020? Yes, it does. To admit people's exhibit 259. Mr. Cook? No, sure. Exhibit 259 will be admitted. Request the, the Detective Farrell publish that for the jury so the jury can see it. Okay. You wouldn't mind just standing out here and just holding it up so the jury can see what we're talking about? You may want to yeah, just walk over here so these guys can hear. Can we publish People's Exhibit 260 now, please? <clears throat> what do we see in People's Exhibit 260? Um, hold on. You've already. 260 was the photograph. 260 but and 261, I believe, are in. I admitted those. Are. Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yep. So, what do we see in People's Exhibit 260? Um, this is the second trash can, and in this trash can is a candle um, that was on top of the trash can. In People's Exhibit 261? That's the candle that we pulled out of that trash can. And was there anything inside the candle when you pulled it out? Um, right inside of here, it appeared to be some sort of fabric. Um, unsure of what it was as it didn't appear to match the carpet or the couch. And there's a brown paper bag in front of you that's in, labeled People's Exhibit 262. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. What is that? That's the candle. Do you need gloves to open that? Uh, if I was to open it, yes. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you want to open it. <laughs> Not particularly. Okay. Let me ask you this. Is is what's in 262 the same thing we see in the photograph, 261? Yes, it is. We do need to open that to know that it's in the same general condition, or is it still sealed as it was when we packaged it? It's still sealed. That's fine. We would move to admit people's exhibit 262 at this time. Mr. Cook? No objection. Exhibit 262 will be admitted. Why don't we go ahead and open it? I'll get you some gloves, okay? There's some there's a box right there. I can approach here just to include some of the items. That's fine.
Go ahead and open them up, please. Okay, for the record, you pulled out an item from that exhibit, and uh, what is that? This is the candle that was in the photograph. You just hold that up high so they in the group can see that. And looking inside the candle, is that cloth material still in there? Yes, it is. You know what that is by looking at it now? Uh, it looks like it possibly might be a sock. Go ahead and repackage that the best you can, and then I'll help you out with this one. Me. Did you also go in to uh, Gannon's bedroom to do a search? Yes, I did. And what did you know when you went into Gannon's bedroom, if anything? Uh, the bedroom seemed to be very clean. Um, there was not a whole lot out of place that I noticed in the bedroom. Um, the only thing of note that I noticed at that point was on the inside handle of the bedroom door, um, there was a brown smear on the handle. Could you smell anything when you went into Gannon's room? Uh, myself, no. And what do you say yourself? Did someone else smell something? Uh, Detective V. Hill, uh, Peter V. Hill smelled Detective and Jim told me. Sustained. Detective V. Hill is gonna be up next, okay? We'll cover that with him. Uh, in front of you, there's some photographs, 263 through 270. Can you take a look at those? You had a chance to do that? Yes, I have. And what are people's exhibit 263 through 270? These are pictures of Gannon's bedroom. And do they accurately depict Gannon's bedroom as it looked back on January 28th, 2020? Yes, it does. Move to admit 263 through 270. Mr. Cook? It's 263 to 270 will be admitted. Request to publish 263. You may, go ahead. What do we see in people's exhibit 263? Um, so this is the far left corner of the bedroom. Um, and this is the bed that was in there that was, um, we believe to be Gannon's bed. And this photograph would have been taken on January 28, 2020. Yes, it was. About 264. What do we see here? This is the mattress from Gannon's bed um, with the blankets and sheets taken off of it. And why did you take the blankets and sheets off the bed? Um, Based on uh, one of the other detectives um, took it off just to see if there was anything of note on the mattress itself. 265. What do we see on 265? There's a discoloration on the far back left corner of the mattress here. We were unsure of what it was at that point. And were you again receiving information from the sheriff's office as to what people were saying about Gannon and being interviewed? Correct. Uh, we had received some information that he did have issues with um, sometimes having accidents using the restroom in the bath and in the bed. Now, as you're going through the house on January 28th and you're in Gannon's bedroom and you see this red substance on his mattress, did you have any idea of what had happened to Gannon at that point? Not at that point, no. You can go to People's Exhibit 264 or 266, I'm sorry. What do we see in 266? Um, this is the edge of the mattress with it just flipped up. This is what we saw in the prior picture. And then this is the side of it that faced toward the wall. So that side of it would have been on the wall where we see the plug back in the background? That is correct. Go to 267. What do we see on 267? Um, here we noticed there was some sort of spot here um, that we weren't sure what it was, but we decided to photograph it. 268. 
that a so, close up of what we saw in 267? Yes, it is. And someone's using a ruler to demonstrate? Yes, it is. 269. What do we see in 269? So this is the inside of Gannon's door. When we got there, the door was actually open all the way to the wall. Um, when I looked behind the door and opened it to see if there was anything back here, I noticed this brown smear on the handle right here. 270. What do we see in 270? This again is the, in, the door handle with the brown smear right here. Now, by the time you're in Gannon's bedroom on uh, the 28th, had you received any information as to the version of events the defendant was giving as to what took place in this house? Um, from what I understood, I wasn't given everything. Uh, most of that was going through the sergeants. We had a lot of moving pieces. Um, but from what I understood is we were getting starting to get some conflicting stories about what had happened. When you started your search, did you start your search as looking for a kid who may be a runaway or missing? versus something else by the times you ended your search? Yes, we did. In front of you, you have some more photographs. We have 271 through 272. Do you see those? I think you misspoke. You only referenced two. Yeah, just 271, 272. We're going to get okay. to the other ones in a sec. Oh, he was just looking through a lot of photographs, so I, okay. Yes, I do. Do you, do you have 270, 271 and 272? I do. Um, what are those photographs of? Um, these are photographs of firearms that I located in the master bedroom closet. And did you, why did you document those of photographs? Um, just because there, something seemed off. We couldn't put a finger on what was what was wrong or what we were seeing exactly, um, but something seemed off. So anytime we run across firearms and we don't know what's going on, we generally try to document them. And do those photos accurately depict those firearms as you saw them on January 28th, 2020? Yes, they do. Move to admit 271 and 272. Mr. Cook? Uh, 271 and 272 will be admitted. Request to publish 271, please. May, go ahead. <clears throat> So where were these, where was this uh, gun that we see in 271 located? Um, I believe this one, I, I don't remember exactly whether it was under the bed or in the closet on this one. In the master bedroom though. And what kind of gun is that, do you know? That's a shotgun. And 272? What do we see in 272? Um, this is a shotgun as well, and this is an AR style um, short barrel rifle or AR pistol, actually. And where were these guns located? These were located in the master uh, bedroom closet. And did you find any handguns in that residence on the 28th? I did not know. We can take that down, thanks. I now want to turn your attention to January 29th of 2020. Um, were you at the sheriff's office when the defendant, Ms. Stock, was supposed to come down and be interviewed? Yes, I was. And were you there when, in fact, she did show up to be interviewed? Yes, I was. Did you have an opportunity to go out and see what vehicle she came to the sheriff's office with? Yes, I did. I went out to the parking garage and located her vehicle on the first floor of the parking garage. And what kind of vehicle was that? Um, that is a Volkswagen Tiguan uh, SUV. And did you notice anything unusual about the vehicle when you located it? Uh, when we located it, the vehicle was actually still dripping water off of it, um, like it had just been washed. There was no rain. It was completely dry outside. Um, so that struck us as very odd. And why was that odd? Um, we'd been trying, from what I understand, the other detectives had been trying to get her to come in for an interview for quite some time. Um, and then when she showed up with a vehicle, um, it's freshly washed. And did you photograph that vehicle? Uh, I did not. Another detective did. Were you there when it was photographed? And would you recognize those photographs if you saw them? Yes, I was. Uh, I'll have you take a look at People's Exhibit 273 through 276. Have you had a chance to do that? Yes, I have. And what are those photographs of? 
These are the photographs of the vehicle that I found that Miss Stock drove to the office. And do they actually depict the, the car as you saw it back then with water on it and parked in the garage? Yes, it does. Move to admit 273 through 276. Mr. Cook? No objection. Exhibits 273 through 276 will be admitted. Go ahead. We'll publish 273, please. Can you kind of point out in people's exhibit 273 with your pointer um, what we see here? This is the vehicle. It's, it's parked nose first into the parking uh, space. Um, and you can notice on kind of hard on this one, but you can notice the water spots in several areas as well as water that was dripping down off the vehicle in several areas. It had only been there for less than five minutes by the time I got there. Now, when you went and saw this vehicle for the first time, did you have a camera on you? Um, the, I believe the other detective had to go back in and get a camera. So it took some time to get the camera and come back out before we actually took the photos? Yes. All right. If we can go to 274 now, what do we see in 274? Um, this is the hood of the vehicle with water drops still all over the top of the hood. In 275? This is the top of the vehicle that as the vehicle dried and noticed the top was still covered in dirt and dust. Was it apparent that whoever washed the vehicle didn't wash the top part of the vehicle? That's correct. And did you notice that right away when you saw the vehicle? Uh, once it started to dry, yes. And 276. What do we see in 276? Um, this is just a picture taken from the back to include all the dirt and dust that was on top of the vehicle. Now, were you able to get inside that vehicle right away? We did not, know. Did you have to get a search warrant to eventually get in and search that vehicle? Yes, we did. Did you search that or someone else searched that? Um, I was there when it was searched by the FBI's um, evidence recovery team. Do you know whether or not the inside of the back storage area, the luggage area, had that been washed out? Unsure of whether it had been washed out, but they didn't find really much of anything in the back. I now want to turn your attention to uh, January 30th, 30th of 2020. Uh, were you part of a surveillance team that was watching the defendant and her daughter, Harla Johnson? Yes, I was. You see the defendant, uh, Leticia Stout, in the courtroom today. I do. Can you point her out and describe what she's wearing? She's in that corner over there wearing, it looks like a light pink uh, sweater or shirt. May the record reflect the identification of the defendant subject to cross. The record will so reflect. Go ahead. Why were you guys going out to conduct surveillance on the defendant and her daughter? Um, at that point, uh, more information had been gathered um, that were making um, the lead detectives on the case a little more suspicious about what was going on. Um, we weren't able to determine exactly what had happened yet, but we were concerned based on her actions um, and how she was reacting um, that there might be something more than what we knew at that point. Well, when you say suspicious, uh, were you aware whether or not the defendant had been taken to Memorial Hospital for what's called a SANE examination? I was vaguely aware, yes. Were you aware that she gave a statement and said that she was raped? I Yes, I was. It makes sense that she would then be taken for a SANE examination after that statement. Yes, it would. Were you aware that she left the hospital? I believe they had told us that she had left, but I wasn't involved with that, so I wasn't sure of, I, I didn't know all the details on that. Was that part of the reason why you were conducting a surveillance? Because she now became a person of an interest, so to speak? Yeah, it was, it was at that point where I was advised they were actually um, writing and seeking a search warrant um, to collect the cell phone um, of Harley as well as her vehicle. So talk to us about, or talk to the jury about the surveillance. What did you see happen? Did you follow them anywhere and things like that? Um, we were at a, at a residence down near, not too far actually from the house um, where they had been staying. Um, we were all in unmarked vehicles. Um, they got, her and Harley got in the vehicle. They drove around town um, for quite some time. We followed them. Um, we had numerous vehicles that were 
that were following them so that they wouldn't know we were we were there. Um, they ended up ending up in a uh, parking lot up in the area of Woodman and North Academy is where they stopped and they went into a store there. But this store would have been the Marshalls over there? Yeah, yes, it would. And so what happened when they went in the store? What did the surveillance people do? So we had undercover agent or undercover officers as well that were in plain clothes um, that followed them into the store and were maintaining eyes on them to see where the cell phone was. Now, in the meantime, were others uh, drafting warrants for Harley's white Jetta and Harley Hunt's cell phone? Yes, they were. And as at, while they were in the store, I was advised by um, Sergeant Abishan um, that the warrants had been signed for the vehicle and for the cell phone. And I was ordered to seize them. And what does that mean when you're ordered to seize something? Um, we take the vehicle, impound it to our evidence facility. We take the cell phone and place it into evidence. And then we would seek a warrant to then get the contents of that cell phone. So what happens, um, let's start with what happens when the defendant comes out of the marshals? So the defendant came out of the marshals by herself. Um, while inside of the marshals, um, we were getting reports from the undercover agents that both her and Harley were both using the cell phone while we were in there. Um, they lost sight of them in the store, so they didn't know who had the cell phone at that point. Uh, Ms. Stock come out of the store by herself walking toward the vehicle. We had determined that we didn't want to let her get back in the vehicle because that becomes much more dangerous for the public um, when, when they're in control of a, a heavy object like that. Um, so it was determined that we would stop her prior to getting to that vehicle to prevent her from entering it and then it turning into something more. Um, as she walked down toward the vehicle, one of the undercover officers um, from our vice narcotics and intelligence unit at that point he had a thrower vest on with sheriff and big white letters in the front of the vest, pulled in between her and the white Jetta and stepped out of the vehicle. Um, as soon as he stepped out, I was pulling my vehicle up um, in between her and the store to prevent her from getting back in the store. Um, as soon as she saw him, she turned and bolted north through the parking lot um, and actually passed my vehicle. Was this Sergeant Ganstein that got out of his vehicle? Yes, it was. And when you say she turned around and bolted, what did she do? She took off running in a full sprint, and he was chasing her through the parking lot. So what did you do when you saw that? Um, I threw my car in the park, jumped out, um, started giving her commands, started following her, chasing her through the parking lot, and she was ignoring my commands at that point. And how were you dressed that day? Um, I was in a uh, khaki pants, a black polo that has my name on it, um, as well as a badge on the left side, and I also had my badge on my belt as well. And you wear that why? Um, to be readily identifiable as law enforcement. And did she acknowledge you as she ran by you? Did she look at you? No, she did not. And so what did you ne do next as she ran by you? Um, as she was running toward another store, um, I drew my firearm and gave her commands again. She turned her head, and when she saw the firearm, she stopped and started complying with commands. When you say she saw the firearm, did she look directly at your firearm? She looked directly at, back at me over her shoulder, and once she saw it, she stopped. So how soon after you drew your firearm did she stop? Almost immediately. Say anything as you drew your firearm? Uh, I was giving her commands to stop long at the sheriff's office. Um, once she stopped, um, then I gave her commands to get down on the ground um, and essentially had her lay on her stomach until certain gas team was able to get there and then place her in the handcuffs. Was the game plan to arrest her at that point? No, it was not, and I informed her of that. Why'd you draw your gun? Um, at that point, I had no idea what she was doing or what she was planning on where she was going. She was headed toward a crowded building. Um, we didn't know if she had the cell phone, and at that point, we believed something had happened to Gannon. We just didn't know what, and we believed she was the person of interest in that. Was it unusual for someone under those circumstances to bolt? Once they see a police officer? Yes, it is. Is it unusual for them to stop once they see you draw your fire? No, it's not. Why is that? Um, generally, when people see a, a, a law enforcement officer draw their firearm and point it at them, they, they in most cases, um, obey commands at that point. I think she would have stopped if you didn't draw your fire. No, I don't. Yeah, to sustain, sustain, jury will disregard the answer. Well, why'd you draw your firearm? To get her to stop.
based on your interaction with Miss Stalk out there at Marshall's parking lot, did she seem to understand what you were saying to her? For instance, when you placed her in handcuffs and things like that. Yes, she did. Did she acknowledge you as a police officer? Yes. After you drew your firearm, did she obey your commands? Yes, she did. And did you have to calm her down at all? Um, I explained to her once we got her in handcuffs, we stood her up and I explained to her she's not under arrest. She's just being detained. We had a, a search warrant to seize the cell phone and the car. And at that point, she acknowledged and then she didn't say another word to me at that point. What happened when Harley came out, if anything? Um, she started yelling over toward Harley as, as other officers escorted Harley out of the store. What was she yelling? And when you say she, you're referring to the defendant? Yes, I am. What was she saying? Uh, from my best recollection, she was shouting, don't tell them anything. And did Harley tell you anything? I did not speak with Harley at all. Do you know if she spoke to anybody? Uh, I'm unsure. I don't think she did. Did you go back and assist in a search of the 6627 Mandan Drive on February 3rd, 2020? Yes, I did. Was this a more thorough search now? Yes, it was. Were members of the crime lab there as well to collect evidence? Yes, they were. Okay. I have a moment, Your Honor. You may. Back on March 9th of 2020, did you have an opportunity to review some video surveillance from a Walmart in Trinidad, Colorado that was dated February 1st, 2020? Yes, I did. And why were you reviewing that? Um, I was advised that the video had been collected as the defendant had been um, caught on video going into the store purchasing something and they wanted to confirm whether or not it was her. And were you able to confirm whether or not you saw the defendant in that surveillance video dated February 1st, 2020. Yes, I was. And what was she doing? Um, she went into the store, um, walked around, looked at a few things, picked up something uh, near the electronics department, checked out there. Um, then she walked out the front doors, um, stopped. Um, they checked her bag and her receipt, and then she walked out, got into the vehicle outside, and they left. Okay. Hold a moment, Yara. Thank you. Those are my questions, Yara. Thank you. All right, cross examination, Mr. Cook. Thank you. Hi, Detective. How are you? Good, sir. Uh, my name is Will Cook, and I represent the defendant, Letitia Stouch. The Nike tennis shoes that we uh, saw in the exhibits from the laundry room at the Mandan Drive house, did uh, did you actually take swab samples of the underside of the shoes at the where the pink staining was? Yes, I did. Okay. And when you take samples, are we talking about a Q-tip swab? Uh, there, it's a pair of uh, sterile Q-tip swabs that are used. Okay. And uh, I take it you have gloves on and then you put the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, the used Q-tips or the Q-tip swabs that have been already uh, used to sample, you put them in an envelope or something secure? So we, after we swab whatever we're swabbing with those, we put them back into the open uh, package that they came out of, and then those go into a manila envelope, which is then sealed. Okay. Why do you put them back into the manila envelope and seal those? Uh, because they, we only use them to sample one item. Okay. 
And you want to have a, 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 a pure sample or an uncontaminated sample, correct? Correct. Okay. And if you put those in and you took the samples, what were these samples eventually tested for, if anything? I'm unaware of that. I wasn't the one that submitted them. Okay. Could these the samples have been tested for DNA, blood, uh, poisons? I mean, it's a whole host of things that they could have been tested for, correct? Uh, those options are out there, yes. Okay. Who makes the decision on what uh, testing is done on a uh, sample that was taken? Uh, generally, the lead detective on the case. Okay. In conjunction with the lab. Who was the overall lead detective on this case with Gannon Stout? Uh, drawing a blank on her name right now. She's no longer with us. Uh, it's uh, Detective Bethel. Detective Bethel. Okay. And she was she the lead detective uh, from beginning to end of this case? I believe so, yes. Okay. And you state she's no longer with us. Does that mean she's no longer with the El Paso County Colorado Sheriff's Office? Correct. She's no longer no longer employed by us. Okay. Is she still working in law enforcement or do you even know? I have no idea. Okay. So uh, she's the lead detective. I know there's sergeants, lieutenants um, that have been endorsed and have testified already. Uh, are, uh, sergeants and lieutenants are above even the detective, correct? That is correct. Okay. So even above Detective Bethel, who was the overall leader of this investigation? Um, overseeing it from the office in conjunction with her at that time was Lieutenant Mahalko. Okay. So this lieutenant was the overall in charge person? In conjunction with Detective Bethel, yes. Okay. Now, before you went out to the house on Mandon Drive, On January 28th, you said you went out there about 9 30, 10 o'clock at night? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, before you went out there, you had already done some work. You had interviewed a Braden Gilliland and Andrew Conant, C O N A N T, and a Peyton Cerilios, C E R R I L L O S. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And also, uh, just within a, a few hours of you going out to Mandan Drive on that date, you also interviewed uh, Genevicia Gagan. First name is J-E-N-N-A-V-E-C-I-A. -E -E Last name is Gagan, G-A-Y-G-A-N. Yes, I did. Okay. And... At that point, after you had interviewed these individuals, you went to Gannon's house? Uh, sometime later, yes. Okay. And so you told uh, Mr. Young during direct examination that you had some baseline of information that you had received when you went uh, on the 28th. That is correct. Okay. And in fact, the day before on January 27th, there had been at least three El Paso County Sheriff's deputies that had gone through the house and uh, did a search and they were looking for Gannon. What we were informed is they had taken a case for runaway as they'd been called out there. Um, and they had done a walkthrough on the house, which is pretty standard um, because kids like to sometimes go in places and hide um, where their parents can't find them. And then that's that's why we check those areas. Uh, OK. And uh, as a detective, I, I see you're in a suit and tie. Do you ever wear a uniform? 
or since you're a detective, do you wear plain clothes? Uh, generally plain clothes or the khaki pants and black shirt. Polo. Okay. okay. Do you uh, ever wear a body camera? At that time, we were not issued them, no. Okay. Have you been issued a body camera now? Yes, I have. Okay. Do you wear it with your plain clothes? Uh, I do with the khakis and polo, yes. Okay. Now you assisted in surveillance of uh, Letitia Stout and her daughter Harley Hunt. Is that what your testimony was earlier? Yes, I did. Okay, what was the address where that was done? Uh, where it started, I'd have to refer to my report. I don't remember the exact number or, or street. Okay. Uh, and you were working with uh, Sergeant Christopher Ganstein? He was one of them, yes. He was one of them. Was he the one leading this surveillance? Yes, he was. Okay. And he's, uh, at that time, was with V&I? Yes, he was. Okay, and what does V&I mean? Uh, Vice Narcotics and Intelligence. Okay. Were you part of V&I at that time, or are you part of V&I now? I was not, and I am not now. Okay. So ultimately, uh, you understood the purpose of this was to get Harley Hunt's phone, which there was a warrant, correct? Yes. And to get the white Jetta and impound it, which there was a warrant for that Harley Hunt had been driving, correct? Yes. Okay. What else were you supposed to do or were those the two main tasks? Those are the two main tasks. Okay. Um, if you were outside this residence where the Jetta was and you had uh, Harley Hunt and Miss Stout both uh, come out and sit in the car, why didn't you just stop the situation then or light them up and go and seize the phone and the car at that point? Why go through this big rigmarole of driving around, following them, having people in a Marshall store, uh, you know, letting them get out into public. Why do that? We didn't have a search warrant yet signed by a judge. Okay. And when did the search warrant come through? I don't know the exact time. I was informed when we were at the Marshalls and I was sitting outside um, prior to prior to Letitia Stout exiting the door. Um, I was advised by uh, Sergeant Gant, or I'm sorry, Abishan, that the warrant had been signed, um, and that's when I was directed to to collect the items. Okay. Now, Letitia Stouch was a suspect or a person of interest at this time, wasn't she? Yes. Okay. And her daughter, Harley Hunt, was a suspect or a person of interest also at this time, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. And in fact, the warrants were only for items that belonged to Harley Hunt, her cell phone and her vehicle. Correct. Okay. On that date um, that you were describing, you weren't out there collecting, you weren't out to arrest Letitia Stouch, and you weren't out to seize any evidence of hers or any items of hers, correct? Correct. On uh, January 31st, you assisted in the execution of a search warrant for a Kia Rio. Can you tell the jury what a Kia, Rio, uh, a, a Kia Rio is? It's a small sedan. Okay, so it's an automobile. Yes. Okay. And you searched this vehicle, correct? I did not. The FBI's um, evidence response or a recovery team search the vehicle. Okay. But there was evidence that was collected from the search of this vehicle. Yes, there was. Okay. And you actually entered the evidence seized from this Kia Rio into the El Paso County Sheriff's evidence facility, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. And it looks like it was a few items, a, a Kia Rio engine air filter, one, 
a Kia Rio cabin air filter one, swab of passenger side rear headrest, soil debris from driver side rear wheel well, swab from interior driver side rear door handle. So it looked like there were different swabs that were taken from, I'm not gonna go over everything that was taken, uh, but it looks like there was swabs taken from different parts of the vehicle and trace evidence quadrant E, D, C, B, and A. Do you recall logging that evidence at the sheriff's office? Yes, I do. Okay. On February 1st of 2020, You did some follow up on a 2016 Nissan Frontier uh, pickup truck, correct? Yes, I did. And was it your information that that pickup truck had been seized or taken in from the Mandan Drive evidence uh, address and actually was registered to Al Stout? He actually drove it to the evidence facility and turned it in. Okay, so he turned it in, but it, your information was that it did in fact belong to him. He owned it and it was registered to him. Yes. Okay. And you entered into evidence information that was collected from this vehicle. It looks like you took in some four trace evidence filters, two cabin air filters from the Nissan Frontier, an engine air filter from the Frontier, swabs from different spots of the truck bed. It, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, se seven different swabs from different locations in the frontier truck bed were taken in and other trace evidence. Is that correct? Uh, so yes. Okay. Do you know if Harley Hunt was uh, handcuffed inside the store? I don't know. Okay. It said in your report, your information was that she was detained though. Yes. Okay. And when you say detained, uh, she, a person that's detained by police, while they may not be under arrest, they can't just walk away, can they? That's correct. Okay. And um, were you equipped with a taser? at the time of this incident where you drew your firearm objection on irrelevance mr cook uh can, can we approach all right The object sorry, the objection is sustained. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Young asked you about evidence that was collected from a Walmart in Trinidad uh, that you reviewed on March the 9th of 2020, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, did you collect the evidence from the Walmart in Trinidad? I did not. Okay. But you reviewed it all? Yes, I did. Okay.
you took screenshots of the video. It looks like in your report, you indicated the video you were reviewing from Walmart, you did take screenshots. Mm -hmm. I'd have to review my report, I don't recall that. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. May I approach? You may. Okay. Detective, um, you want to look at that and see if it can refresh your recollection near the bottom? Is that a copy of your report? Yes, it is. Okay. You see on the first page? Okay. Yes, I do. After you work March the 9th of 2020, did you take screenshots of the video uh, from Walmart that you reviewed? Yes, I did. Okay. What specifically does that mean you took screenshots? Did you just shoot it with your uh, uh, iPhone or what are we talking? There's there a specific device you use to take screenshots of videos or what? It was on my computer where I was reviewing the video. Okay. And what did you do with these screenshots? Uh, they were put on a document and attached with that supplement. Okay. Just a moment, Your Honor. All right. That's all I have. Thank you, Detective. Redirect. Well, thank you. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Detective Farrell? No. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. And before you call your next witness, let's everybody stand and take a stretch. I saw a juror doing that while we were having the bench conference, and it looked like a really good idea. Take that back. Okay. All right. You can call your next witness, please. All right. We'll call Detective Peter B. His name again? B. Hill. B. Hill. All right. Detective B. Hill, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, sir, please. You swear from the testimony about to give you this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Right now, see the seat witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record? Uh, Detective Pete B. Hill. My last name is spelled B I G I L. And what is your occupation? I'm a, I'm a detective with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? 13 years. And have you been a detective all those 13 years? About the last three. Back in January of 2020, what was your role? I just transferred to the SVU unit of the investigations division. And were you asked to go out to 6627 Mandan Drive on January 28th of 2020 to assist in a search of that residence? I was. About what time did you get there? Do you recall? I don't. It was dark. Who was there when you got there? Um, when I got there, it was for the house. The first time I went to the house, there was me and another detective and the house was off and we were just told to contact people inside the house if anyone was there. You're very, very soft spoken. So you may want to just pull that microphone closer to you a little bit. There we go. Is that better? Is it better for you? It is. All right. Thank you. Um, did you have issues with getting into the house when you got there? Yes. Tell us about that. So me and my partner, we knocked on the door, made several loud announcements to see if anyone would come out. No one came out. So then we, I decided just to sit outside and see if anyone would show up to the house or if anyone would come out and maybe just didn't hear us. Um, some moments later, 
light, we saw lights come on in the garage opened up and then we contacted the people that were in the garage. And who did you contact in the garage? Haley and Liana. Was it Lena? Yes, Lena. And Haley Hunt? Harley Hunt, I'm sorry. Yes, Harley Hunt, sorry. <laughs> you got me saying Haley. All right. <laughs> so Harley Hunt and Lena are in the garage. Did you say, what's going on? Why didn't you open the door? I did, but I don't remember what they said to me. Okay. Uh, did you eventually go in and search the house with, uh, was it Detective Farrell with you as well? Yeah. And was there another detective? Yeah, there were several of us. Was that Detective Arndt? Yes. Okay. Is that who your partner was when you were trying to get in the house initially? Yes. So what I want to do is focus in on Gannon's bedroom and that search of the house, okay? Uh, did you go into his bedroom? Yes. Did you notice any smells when you went into his bedroom? Yeah, like an ammonia bleach smell. And what did that mean to you? Cleaning supplies. It's like it was being cleaned. We bought. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you see cleaning supplies in his bedroom? No. Just where, where was, I'm sorry, my fault. Where was the smell coming from? Um, so the light switch was when I was, I was originally told to take pictures of the house once we first got there. So I took pictures of the entire house when I got there and I was at the threshold of his doorway. That's when I started smelling it. And then I started smelling in more obvious areas. There was a light switch. And then when I entered the room, the smell got stronger as I would get into the room. And did you eventually look at his mattress of his bed, Gannon's mattress? Yes. And did you see what appeared to be blood on his mattress? There was a stain on the mattress. And did you swab that stain? Yes. And did you swab different areas of that particular stain? Yes. If I may approach, I'm going to uh, hand you what's been marked as 278 and 687. Yeah, there for now, but have you look at these? Let's start with 278. What is 278? Uh, 278 is a package of two swabs from the bed on the east wall. And is that the swabs that you took from that mattress that had, did it, was it blood or what? What did you think it was? I didn't know what it was at the time. Okay. I don't think any of us did, so we swabbed and just sent it off for testing. All right. So does that contain the swabs, at least, of the portion of the mattress that you did on January 28th, 2020? Yes. And is that package still sealed? Yes. Do you need to open it to see if the swabs are in there? No. Move to admit People's Exhibit 278. No objection. 278 will be admitted. Go ahead. <clears throat> now let's go to People's Exhibit 687. What is People's Exhibit 687? Um, swabs from two additional swabs from the bed located, located on the east. Is that the same mattress, Gannon's mattress, that you swabbed on January 28, 2020? Yes. Do you need to open that package to see if those swabs are in there? No. Move to admit 687. No objection. 687 will also be admitted. I handed you a picture, or at least I put it on your chair there, People's Exhibit 277. Do you recognize that picture? Yes. And what is that picture of? The storage room in the basement of the, the address. And did you take that picture? Yes. And is that actually depict the storage room as you saw it on January 28, 2020? Yes. Move to admit People's Exhibit 277. No objection. 277 will be admitted. Go ahead. You know, at this time, I'd request to publish People's Exhibit 312, which is already in evidence. Go ahead. Detective Vehicle, P uh, v Hill. sorry, it's been a long afternoon for me. Um, we're looking at People's Exhibit 312, which is a still taken from January 27th of 2020. Do you recognize the storage room in this still? It's the same storage room, but it wasn't like that when I took a picture of it. What do you mean? That it's been altered or someone was going through it and moved boxes. Were the boxes stacked up like that on January 28, 2020, when you went and took photographs? No. If we can now go to People's Exhibit um, 277. You may have to mute it, Your Honor, so we can get 277 on there. Turn off the screen for you. Oh, got it. Thank you. It's ready. Okay, we can unmute it. Thanks, Good. Judge. All right. So is this what that same area looked like on January 28th? 
2020 the next night when you were there. Yes. The boxes aren't stacked up as high? Correct. Those are my questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross examination. No questions. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Detective V Hill? No. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. Thank you, Judge. We would call Spencer Wilson. Mr. Wilson, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. Come up a little here. farther. It's all right. Right there is good. You swear from the testimony about to give this medal be the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step. If you step into the stand. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. Have you ever testified before? No. We couldn't tell. <laughs> I'm kidding. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury and then spell your name for the record? Yes, uh, my name is Spencer Wilson, S-P-E-N-C-E-R, Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. Uh, I am a reporter with CBS4. All right, that's what I was gonna ask you next. Um, I wanna jump back even prior to now. Uh, what kind of training education do you have that allows you to be a news reporter? Uh, I have a um, degree from the University of Missouri in broadcast journalism uh, and going on 10 plus years of experience as a television reporter. I've never had the opportunity to do this before as a Jayhawk, I have to say rock chalk to a Missouri grad. I will just say M-I-Z and leave it at that. <laughs> uh, back in January of 2020, uh, who were you working for then? Uh, KKTV 11 News. What was your job assignment in that time period? Uh, I was a multimedia journalist, which just means that I'm a cameraman as well as a reporter at the same time. So one man band. Was it common for you to cover stories in the uh, Pikes Peak region, Colorado Springs, El Paso County? Very common, yes. As a part of your job, would you sometimes interview um, people out in the community? Yes. How, how many interviews do you think you had done at that time of your career? Thousands. On, on camera interviews? Yes. Thousands. Uh, did you start to, at some point, cover the um, Gain and Stout case? I did. How did your coverage start in that case? Uh, it was kind of bouncing around between different reporters. Eventually, one day, I was put on the, the story. And I can't remember if it was the very first day or if it was the second day I was doing uh, the story. But I was out there and made contact with Lestisha Stout. OK. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, was there anything odd about you making contact or the way the contact unfolded for you? Yes, uh, I can remember it very clearly. I was on the sidewalk. Uh, we were just covering a search that day in the neighborhood. Uh, and there was a big moving truck and also a car pulling out of the neighborhood. Uh, and somebody rolled down their window and started to chastise me for coverage, being out there and reporting on stuff and uh, questioned the way that I was telling the story. Uh, that person was Letitia Stouck. And I realized that. And I said, well, if you got such a problem with this, why don't we go talk about it? So when, when this, uh, <clears throat> you, you described two vehicles. It, what you said was a moving truck. Was this like a van, like a utility van? Yeah. And then the other vehicle, what kind of vehicle was that? No better description than just a, a standard car. Okay. Not like a truck, not a SUV, little car car. Which vehicle was the defendant in when the window rolled down and there was words said towards you? The car in the front, the moving uh, car was behind them. She was not in that car. So she was in the, in the actual vehicle, the- That is correct. Passenger vehicle. Mm. What seat was she in? Oh gosh, I couldn't tell you. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> I believe driver's seat, but I, I don't feel super clear on that. Was it uh, immediately apparent to you that the person that was saying these words to you was the was Letitia Stout? Uh, no, it took about five seconds. Uh, and since I had been keeping tabs on the case and uh, the social media along with it, a lot of people were talking about her at the time. And then when it did click, I had this moment of, oh gosh, this is the people everyone person is everyone's trying to talk to. 
What was her demeanor like when she did that? Uh, angry, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, she was not excited that I was there. She was not excited to see other members of the media there. Uh, there was a lot of people down there covering the story. Um, and just the words she said to me were basically, you're doing this wrong. Okay. And so then that's when you make this arrangement to go talk somewhere else. Did you in fact do that? That's correct. Uh, I offered to do an interview. Uh, she molded over for a quick second. There was some conversation in the car. Uh, eventually she said, okay, we'll give this a shot. And I said, uh, being the reporter I was for that station, I don't want everybody else to have this at the same time. So let's go somewhere else. And she agreed that it would be a spectacle if we were to do it right there. So we drove to a construction lot, maybe half a mile away. Okay. And just for contextual reference, was this on January 31st, 2020? Correct. So roughly, I guess, four days after Gannon was first reported missing to the police? That's correct. So tell us, how do you go about setting up doing an on-camera interview in a general sense? And then how did you do it in this case? Generally, uh, I will talk to the person beforehand, kind of give them an explanation of what's about to happen. Uh, this is all while I'm handing them a remote microphone that will then clip onto some part of their body somewhere. Uh, and then I begin by asking them to say and spell their full name and explain who they are to the story. Uh, that's fairly standard practice. I think almost every reporter does that ever. The difference on this story uh, was a part of the circumstances where Letitia was willing to talk to me was in the event that she did not have to show her face. And so I try to get creative because I desperately wanted to have this interview, but at the same time, I could not show her face, which is difficult for TV because we have to show things. I came up with the idea of she looked away from the camera and if I looked towards it, you could still see the conversation happening. That being said, you would not see her face. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, microphone that you just described that would click on somebody's uh, clothing. Is it, does it have a wire that goes to some sort of little control box that is somehow then wirelessly connected to your camera? That's correct. Um, is it typical that that control box to that microphone would stay with the person while that microphone is attached to them? That's correct. If a person walked away from the camera to a different area or, you know, proximity wise, would the camera still pick up on anything that that microphone is picking up on? That's correct. Did that happen in this case? Yes. <clears throat> Was it odd to you as a reporter that had done thousands of interviews that Letitia was asking you to do this interview, but not have her face facing the camera. Not entirely so. Uh, it did make it an unusual situation, but there are some instances where people ask to not have their face shown. We'll sometimes shoot somebody's hands uh, as video when we're talking to them. Uh, and considering the nature of this interview where she was hesitant to do it in the first place, I was more willing to accept the terms of that agreement. Did the fact that you were able to do this interview um, was that a good get for you as this news cycle was developing? My newsroom was ecstatic, yes. Um, did you play along with what, uh, what the defendant was telling you during this interview to keep her talking? Uh, as a part of that training you mentioned at the University of Missouri, it is uh, told to us that in order to have a conversation with someone, you cannot agree with what they're saying, but you do need to keep them continuing what they're saying. That is why, as you're nodding right now, I would nod along with whatever was being said. That doesn't necessarily mean I was agreeing to anything. It was meaning that I needed her to keep saying things. Okay. <clears throat> and you did that in this particular case as That's well? That's correct. All right. Was there a portion of this interview where uh, she asked you actually to redo a portion of it? That's correct. Tell the jury about that circumstance. Um, towards the end of our interview, after we had had a couple different conversations, I was also, mind you, uh, the cameraman in this instance too. So I'd have to stop and walk behind the camera, hit stop, hit start. If we needed to redo things, I think we cut it maybe two or three times, took breaks, came back on, uh, at the very end, this was the thing that was the most interesting to me and why I remember it so much is that, uh, I asked, is there anything that you would want to say to Gannon? Uh, in this interview, she had told me that she believed he was coming home. Uh, she said, yes, gave her statement. And I said, okay, we got it. And then she said, you know, what if we did that one more time? And I said, sure, whatever you want. So I went back, turned the camera back on, but this time she was crying when she was not crying the first time and her demeanor completely changed. Uh, it went basically from, I can't wait till you're home. 
everyone's going to see that I'm not lying. They owe me an apology Two, I will not mimic someone crying, but she was very upset in the second part, uh, which took a second to happen. Based on, on the things that you were hearing coming from the defendant, uh, Letitia Stauk in this case, uh, during that interview, did it seem that she was more focused on how she was being perceived publicly as opposed to um, helping find Gannon? Absolutely. I talked to neighbors who were more concerned for Gannon. Okay. And uh, Your Honor, may I approach with People's Exhibit 334? You may. I don't know if there's been any specific Mr. Wilson, I'm holding a disc, People's Exhibit 334. Do you recognize this disc? I do. Why do you recognize it? Uh, I just watched it in the other room. So did you initial put your signature on it and today's date? That's correct. The contents of this disc, is it a uh, basically a file of that interview? That's correct. Is it fair and accurate representation of your interview? Yes. Can I move for admission of it? Exhibit 334. No objection. Exhibit 334 will be admitted. Go ahead. And permission to publish, Your Honor. You may. Uh, you are? I am Tisha Stout, which is Gannon's stepmother. Uh, you've been a part of the investigation since the very first time. You were the last person to see him. Is that right? Correct. Uh, what, what did you see when you last saw him? Well, I'm not allowed to talk about anything with the case. I would more so be willing to talk about how the community needs to have faith and continue to work together and not make these false accusations, like the things that have been said that I've disappeared from the community. I haven't been there to help, but there's lots of reasons behind that. Uh, reasons like death threats, right? Right. Death threats are one of them. My family's getting lots of death threats. We counted over 20 some death threats already. Um, Two, my husband's ex-wife is living in our home. And of course, I'm not coming home to do these things and to help with the family when I was kind of like told I couldn't. Um, and then many other things that happened with the El Paso County Police Department, you know, and in doing an investigation, I was told I wasn't complying. And could I elaborate on that? Please do. Yes. So I asked for an attorney during the interview uh, and I was denied that by them. I was held because they were blocking the door and I was told I couldn't leave. And that if I would have touched them, they would have probably, you know, said I still wasn't complying or said I was, you know, trying to run away or something. But during the interview, I asked several times, could I stop the interview? Could I get an attorney? Could I stop the interview? Could I get an attorney? I was denied. I was told I couldn't get nothing to drink. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I mean, it was continuously that my constitutional rights were violated. And that's why you say that they said then you weren't cooperating with the investigation. That's why they said I wasn't cooperating at that time. Correct. And why did you ask for an attorney at the time? Well, I asked for an attorney at the time because there was one individual, there was two really good detectives. And so I'm not, you know, going to talk bad about detectives, but the tactics they started to get when I would answer questions, they try to, you know, they're detectives. They're supposed to twist. The one main goal is to find Gannon. But during that time, some of those things made me feel uncomfortable the way they were saying things. So I immediately stopped and felt like, felt like an attorney would help me with some of the vocabulary and things like that, that I needed help with and understanding some of the things that they were asking. I'm going to shift gears to what has become a huge online presence of people right. obviously trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. help find Gannon. But at the same time, sometimes it just feels like rumor mongering. Have you seen any of those comments yourself? We have. And see, that's one of the main things we haven't been around in the public eye because we did, I didn't want to expose my family to it if all these things were going on. You know, there was comments about Gannon getting pushed off the hike and there was comments about this and that's just not true. I took care of Gannon for the last two years in our home because his mother didn't want to do it. And I would never, never, ever hurt this child. And I know there's some questions out there about, okay, so tell me what happens. That's up to the investigations when they end up letting you guys know, but I've cooperated with them, even to the point that we were held with a gun and my daughter, a 17 year old who serves our country in the United States Air Force, who has never committed a crime or done anything wrong in her life, was put in handcuffs over the keys that was in her purse so they could take her car. And they weren't in there. They weren't even in her car. I mean, in her purse. And they were in my pocket. You originally didn't even know if it was a uh, 
law enforcement officer? I didn't know it was a law enforcement officer because when he came out, I guess he was putting his jacket on and it, it wasn't necessarily his fault. He was adjusting and happened to catch me, but I saw the gun and I panicked originally and kind of thought, oh gosh, I got the, like, who's this guy? And then once I realized it was the sheriff's office, I was totally okay, but they still had a gun and told me they were going to shoot me. But I was really concerned about my daughter asking why she was being detained in handcuffs and things like that, when that shouldn't even happen for a child. That shouldn't happen for someone who was standing inside of a store shopping because we couldn't have any clothes because all of our clothes were here. If we came here and got clothes, you know, we would be harassed. So she went to purchase some underwear and things like that and was putting the handcuffs in the store, you know, and then brought out with men with guns. And there's that that's just not OK. You know, they could approach me and said, Hi, I'm with El Paso County. Can I please get this instead of the way that it happened? Yep. I'm just going to check your chat. You're doing great. I want to make sure that we're still good on the recording, still can hear you okay. Okay, yeah, sounds like we're good. Everyone small my mic will be out, and I want to make sure that's not going to happen here. Okay. I, I should try and clarify here. Not necessarily crime rates, but the way that people are reacting online to rumors about you with the search. Oh, oh yes, wow. The rumors have gotten so bad. Uh, I pretty much have been told at least 10 different ways that these people have these conspiracy theories. I guess they watch a lot of law shows and maybe they have all these theories on how um, Gannon is dead. And that's what they're saying. So I'm like, why are you saying Gannon is dead? He is not dead. We are going to find Gannon. And that's the main goal that we all have, my family has. Just because you haven't seen us, we have that same goal. We've been out searching. My aunt has been out searching. My family has been out searching. We all have been doing that together so that we could protect each other. How does it feel when not only you have a lost child who you are in care of, but then people blaming you for that child and shame? You know, I, I'm just ready for Gannon to come home. Most importantly for him to see his family, but second, I am going to be so ecstatic when I'm able to say to people that I hope they have a really sincere apology for all these theories that have came out online, for all the things they said that I have done or people have done. And I just want everyone to know that we're going to find Gannon, and I love him so much. I've helped taking care of him for so long. Can you talk to me a little bit about him? I don't know him. Gannon is so kind and he loves to play video games. That's one of his favorite things. He loves Sonic and Mario and, you know, he's always helpful. And I, he was always so helpful with the dogs around the house. And we have two little cute dogs. And he was always like a person I could say, Gannon, can you go do this? And he would do it right away. You know, sometimes with kids, we have to remind them and things like that. And that's okay. But he was so sweet and able to help anyone. He could notice when you're sick and say, are you okay? And such a kind heart. Um. I know you just said that you can't say anything about the investigation, so you can just say so again if you can't answer this, but is there anything we can hear about the hike? Was there a hike? You don't, that just seems like rumors right now. You know what? Um, could we bring uh, my daughter up here? Because she can, she can go and say that, you know, she came home from work after the hike and she can verify that Gannon was at our home. Okay. Yeah, that's fine with me. And if she doesn't want to, that's okay, but you're allowed to say that. Not okay so far? Yes. I need Harley. I need Harley, because they want you to verify what's Gannon at home after the hike. Because you didn't go to the hike, but you came home from work. Hmm? Well, maybe you say yes. No, just answer the question. Yes, you, you came home from work, and you, ver you couldn't verify Gannon was at home. Yeah. I told her she didn't have to be too in-depth, because she is still, you know, a child. But I want to make sure that someone knows that there's another person to verify that Gannon. Does she need to hold this? No. Yes, so I came home later that evening. I was at work and I can verify that he was there that night. So there there was a hike that you guys went on, but then you guys came home. Yes. Where'd you guys go hiking? Garden of the Gods. Oh, yes, okay. Um, I guess when- And then we ate Burger King afterwards, so, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, And then it just was, I'm gonna go to play at a friend's house. And then it was just, uh. I'm off to go to plans at a friend's house. Unfortunately, I'm not able to like comment on that anymore. And for that reason is because some things have been turned and twisted. And, you know, that was one of those stories you were talking about where people say things. Um, we had to hear things like who would let their child go out at dark and, and things like that. And that and that's just why I don't want to answer that. Um, if I had to give 
I'm not gonna say that part. That's okay. Never mind. We could take that out. I understand that it, it gets tricky with yeah. people's stuff. Do you feel like I asked you what I need to? Do you feel like this is gonna help kind of turn the tide of what feels like a witch hunt, in my opinion? I hope is am I on camera now? You are okay. still okay. Um I think that a lot of people can see that I'm not missing and see that I am being cooperative. And, but to me, it's okay that they think those things because my, the way someone thinks about me, I don't have a problem with that. My main thing is I would never want someone to think that I would hurt Gannon or any of the children in our home, because that's just not the case. I've spent my whole entire life working so hard in education. Um, there was even things online that was talking about my education license and I shouldn't even be a teacher and they just didn't know that like we moved on a military move and I didn't finish out my contract so I gave up my license in that state um, it had nothing to do with any criminal activity you know or any of those things and it just got blown out of proportion on my professional status you know and do you feel like these are just internet detectives who think they know what they're doing it definitely is and you know here's the thing that kind of saddens me it's like if you're going to talk about someone like that and have a witch hunt out for them why would you even care like about doing those things because this is a child you're telling me that you're just as mean you're just as hateful to talk about someone else like that that's how i feel like we just should not we should all come together and wait until the end and, and see what happens because gannon's going to come home any message for gannon the message for gannon i have is gannon when you get here you'll be able to truly tell what happened and then I really hope I get a sincere apology from everyone who has made all those things, especially from my husband. We just wanted to add a message to Gannon from my family is that we love you and miss you. And we hope that you come home soon. And Gannon, I can't wait till you can come home and let everyone know that you're okay. We love you. <clears throat> Mr. Wilson. It's probably very fairly obvious, but the person that you're interviewing there, is she here in the courtroom? She is. Will you please point around and, t and describe what she's wearing for the jury? Pink shirt. You're pointing over to the right-hand side of the courtroom? That's correct. Female at defense table? That's correct. All right, ask that the record reflect to identify the defendant. The record will so reflect. Uh, Mr. Wilson, um, did the defendant appear to be of sound mind to you while you were with her? And yeah. Your Honor, No, he can uh, give his opinion regarding what he thought about her mental state at the time. Yes. Uh, did she seem to be able to answer questions to you logically and give coherent answers? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, to your memory that she was driving the passenger vehicle? Yes. Did she seem to be following the rules of the road? Yes. Could she stop when she was supposed to stop? Yes. Uh, was she driving on the right side of the road as opposed to the left? That's correct. Um, during that interview, uh, do you remember, is there a point in time where she's referring to Gannon in the present sense and then she changes it to the past tense? Yes. Uh, do you remember when that was? Uh, we just watched it. Okay. No, sorry. If we can queue up uh, five minutes and 50 seconds, please. We're going to just replay that portion, Judge, because it happens fairly quickly. He said, yeah, we're in the world. Like, we don't want to use it. It's all too like, it was like, we like, about approach me, approach, hi, I'm, I'm with old Patrick DeWitt. We might have all shut down. That's when we take it. Being off of that child and shame. You know, I, I'm just ready for Gannon to come home. Most importantly for him to see his family, Gannon to come home. Most importantly for him to see his family. But second, I am. Just for, so that we're on track. And so it's paused right now at five minutes and 33 seconds. And then we'll get to that five minutes and 50 seconds section. Go ahead and play it, please. I'm going to be so ecstatic when I'm able to say to people that I hope they have a really sincere apology for all these theories that have came out online, for all the things they said that I have done or people have done. I just want everyone to know that we're going to find Gannon. And I love him so much. I've helped taking care of him for so long. Can you talk to me a little bit about him? I don't know him. Gannon is so kind and he loves to play video games. That's one of his favorite things. He loves Sonic and Mario and 
you know, he's always helpful. And I, he was always so helpful with the dogs around the house. And we have two little cute dogs. And he was always like a person I could say, Gannon, can you go do? Was that significant to you that it changed um, in mid-statement um, from present sense to past tense? Yeah. I'm asking his impression of it. Now I'm going to sustain the objection. I okay. think the jury can draw their own conclusions about it. I'm not sure that his opinion about it uh, adds any extra relevance. Okay. The objection sustained. Okay. Uh, what about when this interview ended? Uh, did she get back into the driver's side, uh, uh, driver's seat of that passenger vehicle to drive away? Yes. She again appeared to be driving and following the rules of the road. That's correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Cross examination. And one and, of the reasons. Oh, I'm sorry. That she expressed she didn't want her face to be seen and she had concerns for her safety. Correct. No further questions. Redirect. Okay. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Mr. Wilson? <clears throat> okay, just, just write, it, write it up. And looks like just the one. And counsel approach, please. Uh, Mr. Wilson, did the defendant stop crying immediately following the interview? Did her demeanor change following the interview? Yes. Uh, let me ask those separately so that um, it's clear which one is you're answering to. Did she stop crying immediately following the interview? Uh, quicker than a normal person would stop crying. And did her demeanor change following the interview? Yes. All right, I will allow reasonable follow-up as to those questions only. Uh, prosecution? No, Your Honor. Defense? Was the camera shut off immediately after the interview, or was there film that was not shown that would have shown her demeanor afterwards? Uh, the relevant pieces of information, the camera was still rolling previous to, or I'm sorry, post that interview. That being said, the microphone was removed from Letitia Stauk, and also I left the scene. So there would have been, though, video to confirm what you're saying about when she stopped crying? Uh, it would have been outside of the view of the camera. I'm not sure if she had the microphone on that at the time. Okay, and that wasn't played for the jury? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You may step down. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our evening uh, recess. Uh, again, don't discuss the case among uh, yourselves. Don't discuss the case with uh, anyone else. I know everybody wants to go home and download some sort of Celebrite program so that they can see what's on their phone. You can't do that. You have to decide this case based only on the evidence presented in the courtroom. Um, so if we can have everyone where they need to be uh, tomorrow, we should be able to start uh, right at the same, or right at nine o'clock. Um, so have a good evening. All rise for the jury, please.